everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to Best Ball with Bindles. We have a very special guest, uh, Sacrilegious, on with us today. We are going to talk uh, Sortino ratio, all things. All things best ball, and uh, let's get rolling. So uh, hop in, everyone, and uh, we'll be drafting uh, later on as well. So let's get going. Welcome, Sack. Um, how's your week been? And uh, how are you feeling? You ready to uh, chop it up and talk some ball for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it, man. Uh, week week has been good. Um, I had a, a busy week, so I really didn't draft um, a ton this week. I say as I drafted literally 100 rookies and sophomores teams, but I didn't draft like any big board teams, man. I haven't drafted any of the uh, the biggest board yeah, either. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, getting some volume in this weekend as we're uh, closing in on the NFL draft. Yeah. How many uh, big boards have you done so far? Um, it's been open for what, like almost two months now? Uh, no, like I guess like a month and a half. Yeah, I think I'm at like 120 something. Let me I'm, I'm loading up my uh, I just pulled up underdog here on another screen. Let's see where I'm at. Um, yeah, I got 114 big boards done and then my little boards are done except for two slow drafts that are in like the okay. last round right now. So awesome. Um, yes, I, uh, so I just wanted to, you know, talk a little bit and start off with kind of, uh, your background, how you got into fantasy football. Um, I, obviously you're a very analytical guy analytical guy so i'm not sure like if you have kind of an analytical background and everything but um just kind of uh i don't know you super well like on a personal level obviously i, I uh know you from the ship chasing discord uh from the leg up discord and everything and uh i've just seen you around everywhere and i think you're one of the sharpest players i've seen so i'd love to just uh get to know you more and uh dig a little bit deeper well as soon as you get to know me more you'll realize i'm not as sharp as you think I am. <laughs> but you're too kind um yeah, a little little bit about my background. Um, yeah, I, I you know do analytical stuff for uh, my profession. Um, okay. So I went to school for a, a finance degree. Um, have have some math background as well. Uh, both my parents are, are math teachers, so I always really liked math. Um, you know, for for a long time, okay. I thought I wanted to be a math teacher, and then. Uh, you know, people told me, oh, you don't actually like get paid any money if you're a math teacher. So, you know, you might want to consider doing something else. Um, so I did. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, how I got into fantasy football. Oh, gosh, when was the very first fantasy football team I drafted? It was probably, it's like, I, I think I might have been in middle school or like early high school. And it was like a, a league where my dad and, uh, and some some people he knew were all in in this league together, and I can't I can't even remember why, but I couldn't I couldn't even attend the draft that for the, my very first team, and so he's like, don't worry, like I'll draft it for you. So I think I had like Roddy White was one of my first ever fantasy picks, not that I got to select, but Roddy White was one of the receivers on my first ever fantasy team, um, and I believe this was like when Roddy White had started to fall off a little bit. So we were when he was a little bit older. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, yeah, going forward from there, um, for like the first year or so that I played fantasy football, I wasn't like so gung ho diehard into it. I mean, I was just a kid, um, but started to get progressively more into it um you know added more home leagues so started with just like one home league then a couple then i was like all right how many leagues can i get in because i felt like i had an advantage um and then after i started doing like in college it was mostly like leagues with friends um 
And then when I got into the workplace, um, there were work leagues where like people had no idea what they were doing. And so I was like, ooh, I should try to play as many of these like casual leagues for money um, as I can. Push and so, I, a little bit. yeah, so I, I was trying to scale my volume up that way. I like wasn't really into DFS at that point and like hadn't really done best ball. Um, and then eventually I got into, I, I just like couldn't get into enough of these casual leagues where it was easy pickings, but like had a few where it was like for me at the time, it was like decent buy-in. So I was like, cool, I'm happy to play in a league for, you know, $500 buy-in or thousand dollar buy-in with people that like, you know, I'm making trades where I'm like getting Derrick Henry and sending Clyde Edwards Hilaire plus, you know, something else. And, you know, anyway, had had some stuff like that where it was just you absolutely know, roasting people. And yeah, you're just players. you're taking candy from a baby, you know, so had had a bunch of leagues like that um, and then realized like, man, the amount of time that you have to invest to actually because I was always super active on trades and in waivers and everything. It's like, oh, my gosh, I have way too many leagues. This is like not becoming it's ceasing to be fun um and it's starting to feel like work and i'm also not able to get down like i have a bunch of these 50 dollars or 25 dollars leagues like what am i doing with my time i'm getting like a two cent hourly rate for the amount of time you know from my edge that i have so sure what I started doing like mfl tens um was the first best ball stuff that i started doing i think i dabbled on ff pc kind of early as well um and then added some when draft launched i i was doing best ball on draft that was when i first started like that was how many years ago like what like five six years ago (sighs) six six years ago is that right is it feel somewhere around there right somewhere around there so i started playing on draft and then when fanduel bought draft i was like I I for sure believe I was so young and naive at that point. I was like, oh yeah, like why would FanDuel not offer best ball on their platform? Like they just draft. Like of course they're gonna roll it out. And you know, years go by. It's like, oh man, it's really not coming back, huh? And so then uh, I started doing um, best ball on DraftKings a little bit, and I still hadn't really played DFS seriously at that point. Um, Really, I I only first started playing DFS more seriously like last season. And the season prior to that, I was like dipping the toe in and realizing it might be something that I'm I'm interested in. Um but yeah, after after playing more on DraftKings, I was like, there's definitely an edge here. I have fun doing this. And like I was doing a lot of work for it on my own, where it felt like, okay, the amount of time that I'm investing in this. I either need to invest less time and treat it as purely just like a time sink hobby and like not really care about it, or I can keep investing lots of time and effort and I need to scale this. So, you know, I'm actually getting some kind of reasonable return for my time and effort. Um, sure. That's the direction that I went. <laughs> that's uh, that's like the struggle of any sicko. Um, and I, I feel like you've said uh, before that like kind of when you find something you, you, dive all the way in you watch every podcast you you listen and read to every article you can possibly find um and that's how i've been for for best ball since since underdog came out so like what that's like three or three or four years um and then dynasty i only started playing a couple years ago and i already have i don't even want to say how many teams i have so i'm kind of reaching that point that you're talking about where i'm like okay where do I go from here? Um, and I, I obviously love it and uh, I love making content as well. So that's part of it. But um, it's interesting to hear like everybody in this space is like truly a sicko and you lo- you love to see it. And it's just uh, good to have like minded individuals. Um, so good to hear. Yeah, I started dipping my toe in a dynasty like probably five, six years ago now. Um, and then like almost immediately realized like, stop, you don't want to do this. Like this is going to be, this is going to be your life if you keep doing this. So you need to slow down on dynasty because it's just like, it's so all consuming to like, actually, if you're in a league of people that are trying hard and like, and you really want to win. And, and then you like multiply that by 30 leagues or whatever, which is like, I was just doing so many leagues at the time. I finally... I like scaled it back and now I only have two home leagues that I really like two managed leagues that I still participate in. Um, And last year I finally shirked my commissioner duties in the dynasty league to a buddy. I was like, dude, I have so much stuff I'm doing between 
creating content and like playing DFS and, you know, having to come up with processes that I, I feel confident in and testing all of them, you know, that it's like, and, and I was a super active commissioner too. Like I would write a weekly newsletter for everyone, like reviewing all the matchups every week and Holy like crap. making memes for every single person in the league about what happened in that. So I, you know, I was just like with everything else in fantasy football, I was all in trying to be the best commissioner I could be for my boys, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I realized like, all right, I got to, I got to step back from this a little bit. So I still have one league where I'm the commissioner I have ceased to do all of the uh, the newsletters and weekly meme duties. Those have been uh, foisted off onto other members of the league who are happy to uh, to create that kind of uh, league specific content. So anyway, yeah, I got the one keeper auction league and then the one dynasty league. Uh, which man, that dynasty league, I I finally won uh, the championship last year for the first time in that league. And I was in a rebuild. the The previous year, I had just shipped off uh, JT, Joe Mixon, DeAndre Swift, um, a couple other running backs. Where I got like, I ended up with for this next draft here coming up, I have three first round picks and three second round picks. So I real like, I just fucking dumped everything. Yeah, my, the only running backs on my entire roster, and this is a thirty man roster with a six man taxi squad so like it's deep you know that's like what i play too yeah <laughs> the only running backs i had on the whole roster last season were kyron williams and aj Dillon. that that was it um and i won the championship with those backs because i had cd lamb dak prescott evan ingram and in tight end premium you just um, hit, hit the nuts everywhere else and, yeah i just had and, the, and kyron yeah. williams yeah i had i had traded for kyron a previous, I think a year ago, um, when there was like the initial hype that McVay loved him and then he sprained his ankle, right. And was out or whatever. And was out for the whole season, basically. Um, I just traded for Kyron and he was a throw in. He was like, I knew that he was getting the buzz. So I was like, yeah, throw him in. Cause the real trade target was Jamison Williams. I, I like <laughs> push the chips in the middle for JMO. Hey, and, you uh, see the lines lines. Yeah. Uh, that was, you know what? I'm like, I feel like I'm the most rational like sports fan it's, it's part partially it's because i play so much dynasty and everything else now that i can't really like be too invested in the lions but yeah jmo man i just especially with olave and all the other receivers that are drafted around him i'm just like what the fuck are you guys doing man Come i'm on. leaving a light on for him still like i hate i hate to be like the irrational truther guy but <laughs> dude he looks he looks good to me i mean like i'm not a full-on film grinder ball knower sure, guy you know sure. but like i do watch you know, I watch a lot of football and like I'll, I'll go back and watch like an entire game for players where I really want to like understand the context behind the data that I'm looking at, because um, I think that's super important. And I know that some of the analysts that I think really highly of have stuff like that incorporated into their process where they're not just a stats person or they're not just a film grinder. They're using the film to add context to the stats. And that's I think that's one of the best things that you can do if you're trying to be an analyst in this space is just like understand the context of the statistics that you're looking at. Yeah, that's something I've thought about a lot too, because it's like, yeah, there's, I feel like there's on Twitter, I know you're not on Twitter, so God bless you. But um, first of all, but um, just, yeah, it's like people are either film grinders or they're dynasty analytics virgins. And it's like, they get into these two camps, right? Like like most things, there's two two polar opposite sides. And I feel like like Jacob Sanderson, I feel like does a really good job. Obviously, Pat, you, there's a lot of other very good analysts in the space that kind of try to bridge the gap the best they can. Obviously, you'll have your your lean one way or the other, but um, it's a constant battle to just try to balance those two things. And like, do I know ball or do I trust trust the, the analytics and the numbers? So I'm glad you, you brought that up. Um, and then... In terms of something that I wanted to talk about first, um, you just you you came up with uh, something, or not came up with something, but you've uh, been talking a lot about the uh, Sortino ratio. Um, so if you want to just go into that briefly, and then kind of how do you think for each position we should be using that to kind of build out our rosters? Yeah, so that's actually a project that I had had the idea for probably like five years ago now. I was like, man, we oh, really? use, 
yeah, we use Sortino ratio to kind of measure the risk adjusted return of an asset, you know, basically like let's not punish an asset for positive deviation for upside, but let's make sure that we're appropriately measuring, you know, how well an asset performs and then what kind of downside deviation you're exposed to with that. Um, and since fantasy football really is like, you know, it's, it's an asset based game. It's a market based game. You're, you're compiling a portfolio of players that make up a team and then that team is producing something for you. Like if it was an investment, it'd be producing return in fantasy football. Right. It's, they're producing fantasy points, right? They're very, you know, it, it's an extraordinarily similar game to, you know, so um, using Sortino ratio always made a ton of sense to me. Um, initially, I had thought of it in the context for redraft because I was getting really frustrated making start sit decisions for players with huge ceilings, but that were also, you know, had a high bust rate. Um, and I had seen other places in the industry that talked about like, oh, what's a player's consistency or, you know, how often, what's their boom bust rate or, you know, their spike week percentage or anything like that. And those are like all, it's, it's like good ideas and attempts to do this. Um, but I think that it was missing like a major, piece in tying everything together so that you have a consistent way to measure it across players um, and then for players within similar tiers of production you know where you've got like all right these are all the rb2s these are all the guys scoring within this threshold of fantasy points per week on average uh here's what their actual distribution of scoring looks like and that's what sortino ratio can help us discern it's like all right one of one of my favorite examples is david montgomery where you know he had a pretty good season especially at cost for where he was going last year but he didn't, he didn't blow you away he had a couple really good games but the sure. magic of david montgomery was that he basically never busted david montgomery made it so that you could have the shittiest running back room on planet earth and you were going to have one of those running back spots be at or above replacement level every week every single week yeah. which people in best ball specifically criminally undervalue right now so i don't think it'll be an edge for a long time because it's like a pretty easy thing to adjust to when as soon as someone lets you know like hey this is an area where we're fucking up um it's pretty easy to then be like you're right i probably should care about getting some of this and it's like it's not necessarily saying like, oh, it's a project, like go towards the projected volume. It's not that it's, hey, when these players produce, their production is distributed like this. And there's a reason that we want players with those distributions on our rosters. We don't just want players that have like a bimodal distribution where it's like Gabe Davis, where you either get zero or you get 25, right? Like, those are pl those players are good to have and the value of those players increases substantially the more that you have kind of that floor built into your roster right so if you've got like an amon ross st brown who also is just like a sortino ratio beast like this God. guy's never yeah that that honestly i had been like an amon Ra hater his his whole career not that i i didn't think the player was bad i just felt like he was so overhyped uh, you know like oftentimes i was like man where this guy's going i'd so much rather have all these players around him and i just ended up underweight amon Ra for like multiple seasons so i i was just like this notorious hater of the sun god um but then when i did the sortino ratio stuff and looked at him i was like yeah this is fucking stupid to fade this guy because uh <laughs> he just like he never fails so it really it doesn't even matter that because my my thing was like, yeah, I mean, he never fails, but you're not really getting too much ceiling from him. But even where he goes in drafts now, it's like when you take that win by drafting Amon Ra, you're you're affording yourself the luxury to take swings for guys that might be able to deliver really high ceiling later um, and not have to worry about getting kind of that floor or that baseline production. Um, so yeah, I think actually utilizing Sortino ratio is just as much of an art as it is a science. Like you have the data to describe the distribution of these players and sure you could probably 
I mean, if you knew for certain what a player's Sortino ratio would be this next season, then like, of course, you could build a process that would like perfectly solve what amount of Sortino ratio for the, all of these players at the different position groups you want to have on your roster. And that would be a way to make sure that you're basically reducing your your risk of having a poor performance in a given week. You're like, you're raising your floor and raising the probability that you have a good outcome in a week without sacrificing your upside. Like it's still allowing you access to the tournament winning upside that you need for these contests. You can still have guys that are going to put up a big score, um, but you're doing, it's basically finding like the bare minimum threshold of players that you need to have on your team. So you're not going to bust too often to not advance, right? That's really, Sortino ratio sure. is definitely more geared towards like an advance rate kind of strategy. Um, but it's not to say that, you know, you're just looking for advance rate. It's more like a requirement. It's a box that you need to check to then say like, all right, now I can go pursue some upside and try and take some swings on players with wider ranges of outcomes because the zeros don't punish me hardly at all anymore. I've got, I've got the guys on my roster that fill in for when those zeros hit, it doesn't matter for me anymore. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the gist of it. Um, but yeah, happy to answer questions if you've got any. Yeah. I feel like um, the, w I was listening to a podcast you had done earlier and you were talking about, yeah, like David Montgomery as the example of someone who just, he's never busting. He's just always giving you that consistent production. It's like, how do you pair that with other guys? And immediately I thought of, uh, Devin a Chan. So I'm like, okay, like if I take Devin a Chan, right, he's the ultimate kind of boom bust type guy, at least in his rookie year. Um, so if you do take some of those type of players where they, they, uh, they do have that kind of a, that more of that bust risk, um, just have that in the back of your mind of like, okay, how am I pairing these types of players together? Um, so that was something that I, I feel like intuitively you, you kind of think about, but I think when you really see that, see the numbers and you have it in front of you, it really helps to just have that in the front of your brain. Um, so yeah, I guess position by position, um, how do you think, like, have you been utilizing, uh, the Sortino ratio and kind of like what type of builds have you been and, and pockets have you been, uh, attacking? So like starting with quarterback, like where, where do you usually, uh, like take your quarterbacks? Have you been taking elite quarterbacks? Have you been pushing it and taking, I know Pat had like an insane amount of Drake may, um, so kind of how, how are you approaching that uh, position? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pull my exposures up too, just so I've got a, something to reference here. So let's take a look here. Um, while, while so, you're playing that up, it's so funny. Cause, uh, do you remember Madden? I don't know if, I'm sure, if I'm not sure if you played Madden back in the day, but, um, there was like the thing where you could kind of like choose your parents. And then, uh, I think it was, I forget what the name of the, the game mode was, but it's like, you basically played first person and you you uh like that was it was like choose your parents and it's like it gives you different attributes based and you're kind of your ceiling based on different attributes when you're talking about your parents being math professors i'm like this is the nut combo for like anything <laughs> analytical is having two parents that are that are math professors <laughs> yeah and in the madden create a player my my madden create a player was always man this i was i was a boomer at heart even as like a 10 year old kid playing madden because <laughs> my create a player was always just the most juiced out linebacker you could ever imagine <laughs> he was just you know 99 and everything useful for a linebacker just an absolute behemoth middle linebacker um yeah you gotta you gotta just absolutely just make him look insane like i remember i would i had a quarterback that played for the green bay packers that was like seven foot tall <laughs> and like you could see over the line so well um so yeah that, that was i don't know why but that just triggered that thought in my brain i'm like this is the perfect combo to uh to do best ball and and do something analytical so um so i'm i'm looking here i've got uh my quarterback exposures up so i my most owned quarterback is drake may like pat i'm not quite as uh crazy on my exposure to him i have 23.7 percent may um Okay. And and this is over. I'm just looking at my uh, my big boards right now. Um I've got 17.5% Tua, 14.9% Derek Carr, 13% Jalen Hurts, 12% Levis, 12% Kyler, 12% Daniel Jones. Um so really for me like on a macro level, I'm 
doing a lot of quarterback in the window. Um, okay. Just like those kind of middle round quarterbacks. Oftentimes I'm hitting wide receiver really early. Um, now I do for me, the last, like last season with the QB prices, how they were, I had almost no elite QB. I had had like, they were I so think high. 1% Pat Mahomes and like 3% Josh Allen. And a, I think a little bit more Jalen Hurts, but I was underweight on all of them. Um, and so for this season, I've got 7% Lamar, 7% Josh Allen. Um, so I'm like getting more exposure to those elite quarterbacks. Um, you know, 13% Jalen Hurts, just because their prices are a little bit more palatable this year. And also after doing the Sortino ratio stuff, I like I had always known Josh Allen had really low downside deviation because before doing Sortino ratio, I was just looking at the downside deviation for, and I was only doing this for quarterbacks specifically for the previous okay. season. Um, Cause when I was doing some of the roster construction stuff, I was looking at one quarterback builds um, and seeing that they, they popped as more viable than the rate that the field was doing them at. Um, and so I wanted to mix in at least some solo quarterback builds. And so I was looking for guys with really low downside deviation, which is, that's the denominator and the Sortino ratio. It's what you're dividing by, right? Um, and so I was using that and I knew Josh Allen like never had, he, he never busted, Jalen Hurts never busted, right? These guys were just always so safe. Um, but last year with their prices where they were, I was like, yeah, I'm just not willing to do it. Like all, and I, last year I had thought that Tua was like a really, attractive spot with where his price was um and people being scared of like his injury risk it's like dude every every quarterback can get concussed like this guy just got an unlucky run out last season um so i haven't hammered to a really hard last year um okay. but yeah this year definitely more in on the elite quarterbacks but like if i if i had to kind of like predict where my exposure ends i'll probably end pretty close to even on lamar and josh allen not that i don't wouldn't want to be like slightly overweight on them it's just that structurally and the players that go around them yeah um, the opportunity cost of getting overweight on those guys is that i end up underweight on some guys that i'm not willing to be underweight on as much sure um they go in a tough range where you don't want to miss out on those guys yeah yeah and then one other thing that i have done at quarterback um for the last couple seasons and that I'm also doing it again this season is evidenced by my almost 15% Derek Carr and 12% Will Levis, 12% Daniel Jones, right? Uh, I've, I've 9.6% Bryce Young. Like I think all those guys probably suck, right? Um, but last year I was working with all of the BBM data from BBM one through three and I was doing some modeling stuff and my models target output was to go ahead and project the points, the total points that a team was going to score um, over the course of a regular season, weeks one through 14. And so what I was finding was for teams where you had a large team stack, where the QB draft capital um, and overall draft capital for the team stack was low. So basically teams that the market is telling you suck. So like last year's Patriots, right? Or this year, the Panthers. Probably right? Houston last year, right? Yeah, or, or Houston or the Giants. Um, like all of those kind of pop and meet, meet that criteria. But the model was saying those teams have the highest variance in what the model's predicting for points. And so with the way that we're playing this game, like variance is a pretty good thing, actually. Like it sounds like some people might be like, oh, I don't want a bunch of variance. Like I want to be consistent and know what I'm going to get. Um, but you can actually leverage that to your advantage and say, cool, if I hit on the Texans of last year and I find that team that the market's mispricing or everyone's really cheap, I'm exposing myself to those high variance outcomes. And when those swing to the positive, like you could probably lose 10 teams that are totally dead because you had a bunch of Patriots with Mac Jones last year. And if you had one that was a CJ Stroud, Nico Collins, Tank Dell stack, 
all of a sudden you're like, yep, feel pretty good about that, how that worked out. Yeah, right. well, it's like you want variance, but you want it cheap, right? Like you don't want variance in the early rounds because you kind of need those guys to 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 uh, buoy your team. But late, I mean, that like it's kind of um, kind of like this the scroll the f down thing as well. Like like after you reach a certain point, it's like you kind of just want the low owned guys and the guys that you truly think. Um, you don't really want any needers at that point. You want kind of the upside guys that can really shoot up either in, in ADP value or just rookies where you think uh, they're, they're going to move up in price as we get closer to the season. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to um, conceptualize that and kind of see it play out uh, with, with quarterback in particular. Like you said, Bryce Young, I think, he, is he actually good? I don't know, but um we have people in the chat just going absolutely wild. I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, <laughs> it's like he doesn't even have to be good necessarily. Like he's, if he's starting um, and he – whatever, like the situation is being viewed by the public as so bad, um, we can we can kind of buy low. It's kind of the same thing as you see in other formats. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, that's kind of my – I take that approach at quarterback and just as on a, you know – holistic roster construction basis like i want to mix in basically whatever the market says are the absolute worst offenses i'm gonna mix these in and i'm gonna go ahead and take some cracks at them and most of them will will miss you know that's just the nature of it but most of your teams are going to lose anyway um and so if this is a lever that i can pull to increase the variance and then say hey all my teams are going to be very structurally sound they're going to be built really well I have confidence in, you know, the player takes and the rankings that I'm using. So when I do hit on these things, I'm going to be able to really supercharge a team. Um, and yeah, like if you had, if you had had a, a CJ Stroud team last year with a full stack, like you're definitely advancing and then you were in a really good position in the playoffs. So yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, that definitely, that kind of encapsulates my approach at quarterback and then kind of leaks over into my, philosophy overall just be willing to buy these really really low priced guys um even though like do i think Derek carr is going to do a ton for me nope like probably not you know like he's so far into his career like it's pretty unlikely we know what he is yeah yeah but you know what like Derek carr did have an mvp season the year that he broke his leg you know he didn't win mvp but he probably would have if he didn't break his leg um and then not get to play in the playoff game that he led that team to and like really what you're looking for is just like, can Derek Carr hit some kind of touchdown variance this season? You know, bank error in your favor, Derek Carr collects 10 more touchdowns than he probably should have had, you know, and that's, that's really all that it takes at the price that he's at. And then all of a sudden it's a smash. And then when you've correlated that bet with team level bets, you're going to get to double dip on that benefit. And now for like the Saints, it's a little interesting because a lot of the times, if you're going to do Derek Carr, you're stacking with Chris Olave, who's not like inherently so cheap that you're going to be guaranteed to benefit from it, right? But like Will Levis, I think is a pretty good example where like, dude, if Will Levis hits in any way this year and you stacked DeAndre Hopkins and Will Levis, and maybe you like mixed in a Chico Conquo too, um, yeah, like. It, it's almost impossible for that to not pay off in a massive way for you just because of how cheap DeAndre Hopkins is. Right. So that's kind of the, the theory behind those bets. Um, yeah. So. I've been all over, I've been all over Will Levis. I just feel like we know so little at quarterback um, and he showed some flashes and he's going so cheap and kind of uh, he has some decent stacking options. So I just feel like, we saw Will Levis, what he had like a four touchdown uh, game. He's willing to throw it deep. I mean, he didn't really run as much as I thought he would run, but um, better offensive coordinator with Brian Callahan that's going to air it out. He had a very high pass rate over expectation. Um, maybe part of that's Burrow, but even with Jake Browning, he was he was letting it, he was slinging it. So, um, so yeah, I think those are some, some very good examples. Uh, Bryce Young and Will Levis, guys that just – seem gross but in reality if you structure your team correctly like you're saying uh there really is upside there and you you want the variance late uh like like you were saying yeah and so like for those guys i'm either tacking them on as like my third qb because i punted qb or i'm doing it with like a really solid qb like a lamar or a josh allen or you know jalen hurts 
Um, and that's just my QB two. And if they do nothing, like it probably doesn't matter. Cause even like the difference between having Bryce young as your QB, you have Josh Allen QB one and Bryce Young's your QB two. The difference between Bryce young as your QB two and Jared Goff as your QB two, when you have Josh Allen as your QB one, like there's definitely seasons where there's literally zero points difference, right? Like it's, there's not a difference at all because Josh sure. Allen outscores them every week, you know, or, or the weeks that, Josh Allen gets outscored by them. Like there's such a minor difference between them because for the vast majority of quarterbacks, they don't separate very much from the rest of the position. You know, like they're typically all going to be bunched together um, and it's a hard position to separate from. And so, yeah, it's, it's just, you don't lose very much by punting QB off when you have a really strong QB one option. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good way to, to explain it. Um, so, and then moving into running back, um, we kind of talked about the, like an example of the Devin H. Chan and David Montgomery, but otherwise, how do you find yourself? Like, who are you, uh, exposed above, above market on and like, where do you find yourself, uh, picking guys in different pockets? Most of my teams are zero RB, um, or, you know, I have a, a little bit of hero RB, but, uh, yeah, for, for most of them, they're going to be zero RB. My highest exposure is Jonathan Brooks, which is, you know, we've been really over on him um, in the leg up rankings pretty much the entire tournament. Sure. Um, so I've got 33% of him, which I'm, uh, I think last year, my largest stand by the time, um, like everything closed up, I think I was in the thirties on a couple guys, but I'm, I'm not, I don't really think I'll be that high. Like, I think I'll have a few players in the thirties, but for most of my players, I'm going to be relatively flat. And that's not like, Oh, everyone's at 8%, but like the guys that I'm over on might be between, you know, like 10 and 15%. I'm not going to have like these huge overweight positions all across the portfolio. And the guys that I'm under on, um, I'll have some like full on fades, but for, you know, most of them, it's like, all right, I'm underweight, but I got 5% of this guy. I'm underweight, I got 3%. It's a pretty big fade, you sure. know. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm going to have exposure to people. Like when I look at my running backs, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I have 10 guys above 20%. Um, none of these go early. The, the earliest running back that I'm over 20% on is Jalen Warren. Um, and and another big leg up guy. That's a big, um, big leg up stand. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, kind of what the best way to play it is right now, which I've seen uh, a bunch of people talk about and we can pair this with wide receivers as well, but, um, it's like what, like middle, like early, um, you want to take wide receivers just because you'll get locked out otherwise, but then you can kind of take four or five take a break in the middle for the quarterbacks in the window, like you're talking about for some running backs and then kind of it's gotten harder a little bit as some of the uh, rookie wide receivers have gotten pushed up due to, due to hype. But I still think there's guys later on that um, give you upside and you can kind of play that Sortino ratio game where you have your guys that are going to be your solid, consistent guys. And then you have your guys that could uh, come on late in the season and, uh, and, or shoot up an ADP later on. So, um, that's how I've been playing it. Um, but is that, do you, are you seeing the same thing or how, how are you playing uh, that? Yeah, I think I can't remember if I said this on a show or if it was in a discord, but I, I said pretty early in the big board um, that I was just kind of making like wide receiver sandwiches where the wide receivers were the bread and then all the other positions were the fillings. Um, and I just start, you know, four or five wide receivers and then get everything else done. And then my last, you know, four or five picks are all going to be wide receiver again. Um, now that there's some guys in those middle rounds that I like more, um, like I had a good amount of Xavier Worthy early, but I wanted to maintain my overweight position. I didn't want to just be like, oh, he rose. Like, I'm not going to take any more of him because he's still not at a point where draft capital matters so, so much. You know, like he rose a, a very good clip, but the difference in draft capital is small enough that it's like the teams that had Xavier worthy early at the cheap price, like they have a little bit of an advantage on you if you take him now, but it's, it's such a small advantage that it's not worth like 
taking a strategic stance, like, oh, I'm not going to have any Xavier Worthy now. Just completely he rose. missing out on the player. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's something um, that as a kind of a, a best ball community, we can people can do better at is not getting so locked into, I oh, well, I didn't get the guy at the best price, so now I'm going to fade him. It's like, if it's someone going after pick 100, like, don't really worry about it. You know, like, it, it's sure. okay if, if a guy climbed six rounds if he went from round you know 19 to round 13 it doesn't really matter man like because what actually has to happen for you to get punished here is you need that person to have hit a multi-leg parlay on their picks from rounds 13 to round 19 like you need not only for that player that they got in round 19 that you took in round 13 to smash right that's critical um and if that player smashes like you're happy anyway you're like oh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter right i still i still get a win you're only disadvantaged if you run into these other teams in the playoffs and then they happen to hit some monster parlay between rounds 13 and 19 where they just, you know, they threaded together stuff like last year. If you had done like a Raheem Mostert plus a Jaden Reed plus a Puka Nakua, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, all right, now it does matter that this guy got this guy so much later than you because it gave him the ability to fit these other guys in where you didn't have that same lug. Those guys weren't possible for you to combine together. Um, but for the most part, it's like, don't really worry about it. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be, a, you're going to do yourself more harm than good. Um, if you just preclude yourself from drafting players that have risen, basically. Yeah. You don't want to be completely scared off. Um, we have a question from Hoosier Devo, who's a regular. Um, he's talking about the Achan Monty talk, but he said why he's he's asking why does Achan go so high, basically. Yeah. So this is something I've seen a bunch of people talk about, and I've like restrained myself from typing in these different Discord channels where I've seen people making this mistake. Um, because I'm like I'm starting I, I'm learning valuable lessons for myself, and I'm learning that I don't need to correct every mistake that my opponents make, where before I was like <laughs> Everyone's so fucking You're stupid. Up There's the so much stuff that I can fix. And now it's like, you know what? I don't need to give all the alpha. Like, I'll give all the alpha to the leg up subs. They can come find it in our Discord. Um, you know, but like in all these other Discords, I don't need to give all the alpha away. Like when I see people saying really stupid shit, I'm like, old sack would have gone and started typing a dissertation for why this is the dumbest shit he's ever heard. You're, and like you're older and wiser now. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm one whole season older and wiser, <laughs> you know? So, um, but no, so the thing that I'm seeing people talk about is dr using season long projection for like a player's compiled stats to drive their best ball rank. So like, Oh, but but a chain might miss some weeks or, Oh, he, you know, he's going to boom in some weeks, but he's going to bust so many. He's not going to finish as the RB four. it. I don't give a fuck if a chain finishes the RB four or if he finishes the RB 24. What I care about is is frame it this way. It's week 17. You open up the ETR projections. Who are the people that are the highest projected ceiling yeah, points okay. on that week? I don't give a shit what they've done to this point, right? Like all I care about is who's going to project the highest when it comes to week 17. And, and really it's by extension, like it's the playoffs. It's weeks 15, 16, and 17. You're going to open up the ETR ranks. Which of these players projects higher? You don't, I don't care that Marvin Harrison Jr. Was the wide receiver 19 in weeks one through 14 in his total compiled stats, right? Couldn't matter any less to me what his average points per game were in weeks one through 14 if in week 15 he's projected as the third highest wide receiver that's what i care about and that's what matters that's actually wins you playoff weeks and gets you into the championship and wins you money it's not what this guy did in weeks one through 14 that helps you get there but like getting there is so much of a random walk and also there's going to be a pretty high degree of correlation between what their season-long production is and what they're going to be projected for in weeks 15 through 17. But so many people, and especially people that are driving their rankings by a projection-based process are running into this mistake and you end up overvaluing players that are worthless. You know, like for example, um, like let's, let's think of a good guy who had like a pretty good Sortino ratio who not, wasn't really busting, but never really delivering spike weeks. Um, Oh gosh. Like maybe a like Chris Godwin 
did okay. He he, yeah, he, he, he wasn't like, like a very good example. Yeah, he wasn't like great last year. Let me I can I can pull him up here to kind of see where like he's, he's not, at. He's not hurting you that much. Like he's he's not busting necessarily, but he's also not really giving you any spike weeks and and in that week 17 uh projection ceiling projection like you're saying like he's going to be pretty mid in that uh aspect so yeah okay this is man oh this is uh this is great what a what a great player to pick so in 2023 his sortino ratio was basically zero it was negative 0.002900 so this is a this is a replacement level player so like all, all he is doing is not letting you bust for the most part, right? Like that's what he's doing. Um, he's making sure that you don't take a zero at wide receiver. So if you started with a bunch of wide receivers that have a really high Sortino ratio, like if you started, you know, let's just, we're going to make a hypothetical team that couldn't possibly exist. But if you're like Amon Ross St. Brown and Tyree Kill and CD Lamb, and you've got those, you should basically never take Chris Godwin on that team. There's nothing; he'll never hit your lineup. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's it's not going to do anything. Yeah. Um, but you should instead take players that are going to have a little bit more volatility in their range of outcomes. So just go ahead and take a rookie because rookies are the way where that's immediately the player with the highest amount of volatility, right? A guy that we have no data on, we couldn't, can't properly, you know project what they're going to look like we can have like an idea of a range of outcomes for them but like we're going to be so much much less precise on rookies compared to players that we already have a lot of data on and so it's like yeah they just don't take chris godwin in that example and so like kind of translating that to the week 17 thing it's like Chris Godwin's going to finish as like the wide receiver 28 because he compiled a bunch of stats, right? You've got, you know, a thousand yards and 90 catches or whatever it is. And then you're like, well, but Chris Godwin's going to finish so much higher than these other guys. It's like, yeah, but when we flipped the cards over in week 17, Chris Godwin was projecting for, let's just say 11 fantasy points. And Jaden Reed was projecting for 15 because he was getting a bunch of target volume. Then it's like, Jaden Reed was going, you know, nine, 10 rounds later than Chris Godwin. And that was an infinitely better pick. Even if you had to take Jaden Reed at, at Chris Godwin's price, if you knew what week 17 projection was going to look like, you would do that 100 times out of 100. You'd take Jaden Reed with a four point projection difference over Chris Godwin. That was, of course, you know, no brainer. Um, and so that's a thing that I feel like. I mean, it, it probably won't take people too long to figure that out. Um, but like right now, that's a big flaw in people's. And that's that's one of the like things I've seen people using as like FUD for, oh, well, it's it's too expensive to take Marvin Harrison because like he's the wide receiver 10. And like, do you really think he can finish as the wide receiver 10? That's not the question that we're trying to answer in a best ball tournament. It's do you think Marvin Harrison can be within the top 10 projected players in any of the weeks, 15 through 17. That That's, really matter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of people are coming from other formats where they just aren't even, they, they're not even conceptualizing that like fact that like, like I know you've said, and many people have said like, my, most of our teams are going to lose anyways. Right. So well, like we we really only care about those those last three weeks in the playoffs, and that's like that's a perfect example of like this guy is just he maybe in like a dynasty league where you have three wide receivers and three flexes, and you just need a guy to fill your flex and just give you consistent like those kind of guys are way more valuable in a dynasty like deep dynasty format like that where you know what you're getting. You're not starting Darius Slayton in your in your flex spot, and he's gonna bust a lot of the time, right? Like. That's completely different than than best ball and big best ball tournaments. Uh, so, yeah, I think I, I agree that I think like some people will catch on, but I still feel like generally that will be something that people uh, don't catch on too too quickly. If I'm being completely honest, yeah, I mean, I know that uh, I know a, a big chunk of the industry drives their rankings purely from projection, um, and so that's just always going to be fragility in that process is you're going to end up overvaluing dusty veterans. You're going to end up overvaluing 
guys that just compile stats and never really delivers spike weeks. You know, guys, guys with the Chris Godwin Sortino ratio, where this is a great pl- like in a in an alternate universe where we're drafting zero wide receiver teams, we're loading up on running back early and and then backloading wide receiver. Chris Godwin's incredible. It's like, oh my god, like he never busts for me. He's always going to be there to to fill my slot at a replacement level. Like that's fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, that's, uh, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> what about, um, so what about tight end? Um, I feel like it's just crazy to me that Andrews, um, McBride, Kelsey are kind of all going in that, like, what is it? Four or five turn area. Um, I'm a, I'm a huge Mark Andrews fan. I have way too much of him in dynasty. Um, and I think people are just uh, still assuming that he's going to be injured going into next season. I don't really understand that one at all. He's ba- he's the, basically the wide receiver one um, for the Ravens, uh, which, and he, when he's not injured, he's been uh, extremely elite. Um, Trey McBride, I feel like, um, yes, they're probably going to draft um, Marvin Harrison, but like, even if he's the number two target, um, there's not really much else there. So I just think he's going to get fed targets. And then Kelsey, it's like I'm going to keep drafting him until he is out of the NFL because uh, just whatever. He's Travis Kelsey. Um, but how are you playing tight end? It feels like it's not as fun later on as it was early in the big board. But um, what like what kind of builds do you usually find yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm so I'm like a little contrarian to what the like consensus for the analysts that I respect the most, the people that I think are really sharp where I'm like, yeah, I, it, you know, if I had to pick someone to draft all my teams, like these are the people where I'd be like, yeah, you, I, I trust you. You'll draft some solid teams for me. You know um, I know most of those people are pretty anti kind of the late tight ends this year. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely doing it much less. I guess the way to frame it is, Last season, I was like, there's so many late tight ends here that I like that I'm pretty much always going to be punting tight end or not always, but very often punting. And even when I don't punt, I'm probably going to tack two extra tight ends on here at the end of the draft. Um, Or if I got an elite guy, my my last pick will be a tight end and I know I'll find one that I'm happy with Um, because there were so many. This year, I'm much more discriminate with the tight ends I'm actually selecting late, but there are guys that I think are very viable late. So that's kind of where I'm deviating the most from the people that I think are good at this game. Um, but I am like, for example, for the the elite guys, like I'm overweight Mark Andrews. I'm almost double the field Mark Andrews. I'm a little less than double the field Trey McBride. I was really heavy Trey McBride at the start, just when his yeah, ADP was, was like really silly. That was the craziest thing I've ever, like what? <laughs> I just don't understand because I think previously I'm not sure how, like if it was Hayden wings putting in the, like the rankings or what it was, but I still don't understand how Trey McBride was so low to start out. Like, I, I just don't know. Don't... And and Hayden said it was not his ranks this year. I, I think uh, someone, someone had said that, Oh, like time to exploit the Hayden ranks. And he like came out and said like, it's, it's not my ranks not for me, the record. Yeah. Um, he's like, my ranks are up on my Twitter or whatever. Um, so They weren't the Hayden ranks, but yeah, whatever, whoever set the initial ADP, like Trey McBride was the generational wealth opportunity that they presented. (laughs) Just honestly, I like, I drafted a shitload in the first couple of days. So like this, I got to hit this, but yeah, that's the time. Looking back on it, like, I wonder, (laughs) it would have been a fun experiment to like set Trey McBride at, you know, basically two rounds ahead of ADP in your rankings and literally just rip auto draft like as many auto drafts as you could in that first couple days you know and just like i don't have you know like when they dropped the big board i hadn't even done all my rookie stuff yet like i wasn't i mean that was so early this year yeah Yeah. i wasn't acquainted with all the rookie class i was like shit i wasn't planning on like i needed to do some work before i felt good about drafting and like understanding the rookie class um but i i wanted to jump on trey mcbride so but yeah, it would have been a funny experiment to just be like, all right, I've got Trey McBride two rounds ahead of ADP here. We're just going to see how much Trey McBride I can actually get and just keep adjusting it for like a couple days right after tournament release to like keep pushing him up and getting a bunch of him. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I've got a lot of Trey McBride. I have a lot of Mark Andrews. I ended up, so in that Trey McBride drafting period, right after the Super Bowl, 
I had the galaxy brain idea that both Kelsey brothers were retiring. Um, you know, I, I thought, hey, they're both old. They're both going to go out at the same time here. And like the podcast world and just. Yeah. And, and what better time, you know, than to to ride off into the sunset after you won a back to back Super Bowl with Taylor Swift, billionaire pop star icon as your girlfriend. Like, dude, Travis Kelsey had the easiest like ride off into the sunset motivation of all time. So I was Absolutely. like, man, that's a that's an easy that's an easy one. So I wanted to play it like. Kelsey was retiring. And so I drafted a bunch of Noah Gray, like so much Noah Gray <laughs> in those opening weeks. And then uh, like after I got up to like 20% Noah Gray, I was like, oh, we might need to consider the possibility that Kelsey may not retire. And then it started to look less and less likely um, that he was going to retire. So I begin I begun mixing in Kelsey. Pat's really high on Kelsey and has convinced me to come around on him. I'm still underweight Kelsey right now. Um, but yeah, like for the the Andrews and McBride, I'm like double the field on those guys. I really like that as a spot. Um, there are two. So I've got three really late tight ends that I'm almost triple or I'm like, I'm between 30 and 20% on these three late tight ends. Um, and two of them are guys that I've been, absurdly overweight on in the past um, i wonder it, i wonder if one of them is the guy that i'm absurdly high on as well uh, yeah yeah go i mean i'm all, i'm happy to share him but go go ahead and guess i i love fun. no fan i know he didn't get the nut landing spot that we uh that we were hoping for but honestly i think people are downplaying like they got rid of colby parkinson they got rid of uh who's the fucking other guy will disley yep right and they have a coach who's not a dunce and i think they're gonna just they have a uh, offensive coordinator who's uh gonna have a really good vertical game schemed up um no fant runs i forget if we're at four five nine or something but his raz raz is absolutely insane um it's it's i'm it's been sad but it, i felt like like the hipster like where i have a band and like then it blows up and then i'm like what the fuck like i was on these guys like two years five years ago um because last year i like i think uh Tyler emo cowboy was roasting me for my Noah Fant shares last year. I think I had like 25% Noah Fant because he was just going like last round. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Noah Fant is one of your guys, but I've been heavy, heavy Noah Fant. 28.9% Noah Fant. So yeah, um, we're okay. That makes me feel better. We're the I'm president of the Fant fan club. And yeah, like this is, I mean, sometimes there's some stuff in fantasy football where it's like, it doesn't have to be, there's a lot of stuff in fantasy football that's hard and there's some stuff that doesn't have to be that hard. Right. And it's like, yeah, what we're saying when we draft a shitload of Noah Fant is not like, this is a can't miss kind of bet. No, no, no. We're saying this bet absolutely misses way more times than it hits. But when this hits, I just got a guy in the 20th round who like I could easily see like right now he's being drafted as a tight end 27 like I could easily see him being a top eight tight end, you know, easily. on the season. Like it's not even, I don't even think that's crazy. Like I, I could see him being a top five tight end, you know? Um, and, and the other thing is to kind of frame it back to that projection in weeks 15 through 17, like there's definitely a universe where I go in and I'm looking at my DFS projections from ETR and it's like, all right, no fans got the third highest ceiling projection here in week 17. You know, it's, Trey McBride, it's Mark Andrews, and then it's Noah Fant right ahead of Travis Kelsey, you know, who has been kind of, they're, they're saving him for the playoffs, right? So, like, that's, when you have players that are, like, that freaky athletic, like, he's really good after the catch, like, he is, he's a receiving weapon kind of, like, that's, that's the kind of player that I want to bet on. And at tight end, it's just so easy to, like, for wide receivers that don't break out for a long time, it's kind of like, uh, it's probably Jover for this guy, but for tight end, it's like, this is par for the course. Like it takes Absolutely. a long time often. Um, you know, I'll never forget one of my, uh, first fantasy championships I ever won. I had drafted Gronk as my tight end. And then I picked up Gary Barnage off of waivers Jesus and it was the Gary Barnage season. And I played Gary Barnage in my flex, like damn near the whole season because he was outscoring my other wide receivers, like the wide receivers I would have put in flex. He was just crushing. And so it's like, I will never forget that Gary Barnage just out of fucking nowhere broke out and was one of the best tight ends for fantasy. Um, 
so yeah, like Noah Fant was one. The other one uh, is Jawan Johnson. And Jawan Johnson is just like such a clear spot for me where it's like, this is basically Darren Waller. It's a converted receiver. He's playing with a quarterback that has, you know, heavily targeted tight ends in the past. Um, and, and also like this offense has shown like they're down. I don't, I don't know if you remember two seasons ago, but like there's a stretch where Jawan Johnson was just cooking. I think it was like a six game stretch. Where he, was he was going just, ham for a little bit. Yeah. And, and again, like, I don't care if like for the, for Jawan Johnson versus Noah fan, I don't think that Jawan Johnson can be the tight end five compiling stats on the season. Right. I don't think that's sure. really in the, maybe that's his 99th percentile outcome. Right. Um, but like, could Jawan Johnson be like the fifth highest projected or seventh highest projected tight end on a week come the playoff weeks? Fuck yeah. Like Absolutely. easily, you know? And so just, just because he's that archetype of player, like he could easily be involved as like a primary receiving option in this offense. And it's not like, like <laughs> new Orleans is not spoiled for choice for receiving options. Right. It's like Chris Olave A.T. Perry. I was going to say A.T. Perry. Dusty ass Alvin Kamara and then Jawan Johnson. And like, I'm certain that they're going to add someone, you know, in the draft. But like, there's a pretty clear path to me for Jawan Johnson to be a really good pick and be the number two, the number two target. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, like, and again, it's the same thing as the Noah Fant bet. Like, I'm not saying this hits very often, but it for sure hits enough to be worth clicking at this price, especially because Noah Fant, or excuse me, uh, Jawan Johnson is a nice uh, bailout emergency stack where you can do the, oh shit, uh, all right, Derek Carr, Jawan Johnson, double tap. Like the backdoor stack. It's yeah. Stack. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, any other weird tight end stuff? How do you feel about, I, I like Hunter Henry too. He's going a little bit higher than he was last year. Well, I guess in August, I think he got pushed up. Hunter Henry, he's going a little bit higher. He's about like pick 180, 175-ish. I thought I had a sprinkling of Hunter Henry. Maybe I only have him in, maybe I've just happened to only click him in little boards because I'm just looking at my big board stuff. And I, let me search for him rather. It's also weird because we don't necessarily know who their quarterback is going to be. So I think once we do know who the quarterback is going to be in New England, if it's, well, if I guess it's, if it's not Jacoby Brissett, um, then I feel like he'll move up a little bit, like not a ton, but just a little bit probably just because there's a little bit more certainty if people are trying to get stacks and stuff. But I um, feel like he still feels pretty solid as a guy who can, as you said, like he can score two or three touchdowns in a game. Um, and there might not be that much competition uh, for targets and stuff. So, Oh, they signed Austin Hooper. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I just looked. I don't have um, Hunter Henry in the big board yet. Um, but, like, he's he's certainly a guy that I'm fine to mix in. Um, and he's, like, if you remember back when he was a Charger, um, you know, we were, we were stoked about Hunter Henry, right? Um, like, people were all gassing him up that he was going to be the next Gronk. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I definitely could see mixing in a little Hunter Henry. Um, I'm not so wait, like, who, who is your third guy? Who's your, who's your third? You said you had three. So John Johnson fan. And who's your third, who's your third, uh, uh, skeleton key at, uh, at tight end. Yeah. The, uh, my third guy is he's someone that we're really high on in the leg up rankings. The combine wasn't, um, the best for him, but, uh, but he's, he's a rookie, um, that we're excited about. And that's Jatavion Sanders. I've got 21% of him. Okay. Yeah, I was I was I was higher on him pre-draft or I mean uh, pre-combine as well, but I still think he's a pretty pretty good bet. Um whatever. He's still probably going to go second round, right? So um. I yeah, I would I would think so. Um and then uh beyond that, I actually have two guys that I kind of like for just like not appropriately priced um tight ends given uh given where they're going and like what I see for their for their ceilings um, and they're more mid round guys. And that's these two players are the reason why I'm not even more overweight on the elite guys like okay. Kelsey and Andrews and McBride. Um, and that's Evan Ingram, um, who is my preferred way to play the Jaguars passing game. Um, and Cole Komet, who 
Cole Komet ran a little poor with getting the Keenan Allen trade landing there. Um, but I don't think it, I mean, like it, it absolutely is worse for him. Um, but it's not like a death sentence. Like I still think Cole Komet's really viable. Um, I, I think he, you know, he was already popping for me. Like even if it pretend that the bears just stuck with Justin Fields, even if that was the case, I would still been hammering Cole Komet. Um, so yeah, I really like he's going pretty those. Big, yeah. yeah, I liked both of those spots. Um, but yeah, Evan Ingram is is one that I'm pretty excited about. I I'm kind of surprised that the market um, didn't come around more on him. Just with the like every everything that Jacksonville is telling us, like when they first got Evan Ingram and they franchise tagged him, it was like Doug Peterson wants to see because Doug Peterson's always liked to utilize you know a, a tight end in the underneath role. Like that's when Dallas Goddard was having his best seasons. Yeah. And Zach Ertz, Exactly. Um, and so it was like, all right, let's see, can Evan Ingram be this guy? And it was met with a resounding yes. And so then they gave him an enormous bag, you know, and, and so they were all in on Evan Ingram and fed him just an absurd amount of target volume last season. And then this season, his target competition got a lot weaker. Like you replaced Calvin Ridley with Gabe Davis. And so, He's not drawing targets. Yeah, it's just like to me, it feels like like here's here's an easy one. This is this is like the slammiest dunk of all slam dunks. Um, Evan Ingram versus Dalton Kincaid. You know, like why would I ever click Dalton Kincaid over Evan Ingram, who's going like a round and a half later? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, like. Yeah. Oh, influencer 101. Hey man, let's brother, go. let's go. Um, um so who 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 you been going uh 101? You just taking McCaffrey? Yeah, I don't I don't ever deviate um really from ADP inside the top like AJ Brown when when Gibbs was going before Brown in ADP, this is where I would potentially deviate, which you can see by my 16% AJ Brown versus 6% Gibbs. It's not that I want to be really light on Gibbs. Um, it's just that I much prefer having a receiver start um, given the current right. draft landscape. Um, but yeah, I don't really want to deviate much at all early. I just want to kind of get my, my balanced exposures. Um, and that's something I've been working on um, kind of behind the scenes right now at leg up. I've got an article talking about balancing your portfolio and a new metric that I came up with to kind of measure how well um, all the 150 maxers in BBM last year uh, diversified their portfolio and kind of a way to measure, um, you know, that, uh, and then coming up with ways that we can be better about diversifying our portfolios going forward and just in ways that I don't think people in best ball are doing yet. And then like the data that I looked at on it and the metric that I created, like kind of confirmed that, that people are really bad at it right now. Yeah. Um, just like as a whole, like it's not, not to call out anyone individually. I mean, when I, when I drop the article um, and have all these stats out, there will be people where you're like, Oh my God, like that is the <laughs> least diversified person I've ever seen. Um, but it's in general, most people are really bad at it. And then there's a few people that are like halfway decent at it. But I think that that's an area where um, in this space, we've got a long way to go. And so we're kind of working on that behind the scenes at leg up right now. Basically, there's no way for a human brain, no matter how good you are, like you could be the smartest person of all time and have a perfect understanding of the player pool and know all the range of outcomes like with insane precision and be right on all your takes and you'd still suck at diversifying because it's not it's not the kind of calculation you're going to be able to ever do in a draft do, with yeah. a human brain you know um so that's the thing that we're working on to kind of kind of make that uh turn that weakness into a strength for for our subs anyway awesome yeah i um I am not a DFS guy at all. Like I've like barely dabbled at all. Like at all. Uh, I did a, a few, like I did a few, a few years ago, but like that is something like you, you talking with Neil uh, Orfield, um, shout out to Neil. Um, but just, I'm trying to consume more like DFS type brain content because I do think there's so much to be learned from there. And there's like, we're still so early with best ball, even though, 
it seems like we've it's been going on for a couple of years, but we're like the general public is still so behind on so much stuff. Um, and that's something that like like you you've talked about kind of that kind of like game theory type stuff. And um, I'm just yeah, that's something I need to I need to I feel like I'm 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 not an analytics guy in terms of like I'm doing the analytics myself, but I feel like I have a pretty good understanding from other people. I feel like I know ball pretty well. I, I played football. I watch a lot of football. Um, but the the kind of game theory part is something that I think I need to lean into more. So, yeah, and that's for me. That's like the part where I feel like that's my largest edge. And so I've I've always like had a struggle with like how confident do I really want to be in my player takes or things like that. Um, where like I have a pretty high degree of confidence that I've got an advantage over here. Chipsy, I don't think you you came out that bad, my man. Um, I'll pull I'll pull it up. Um, just it's fun to fun to kind of look at this. Um, let's see, let's find where Chipsy, where old Chipsy. But yeah, no, here. you were you were talking about like you you pick up on games really quick. Like that's kind of the thing that you feel like you have an edge on. So that's it's I'm I'm trying to learn from you and others in the space that kind of have that edge because I don't think that's my edge. So. Um, you know, there's 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 many different uh, things you can do to up your game, and that's one that I need to work on for sure. Yeah, and uh, and honestly, like for DFS, I I recognized how the portfolio diversification stuff that I'm talking about in the through the lens of DFS is very mathematically complex, and the time in which you have to make your lineups and then do these calculations for diversification. I was not able, I'm not a good enough programmer to get that done in the time constraints that I've got. Um, oh, baby is, oh, who's your Devo is in the chat. Um, so I won't. Yeah, we, we have, uh, uh, Steph is in here, super shorty. We have who's your Devo. I think we have a couple other people in the chat. So we can, we can utilize the private chat if we need to. We don't want to, you know, make the big, big streamer mistake of uh, blowing our picks ahead of time. Yeah, well, he can see that I basically never take Stefan Diggs. So, uh... so... Oh, and he does he does the Allen. So I would have gladly double tapped a Diggs Allen there because I'm really underweight Diggs, and I'd like to get more exposure to it. For me personally, I mean, I I actually have like no Adams Diggs and CMC, and so um, I'm just, yeah, that that seems fun. I'm kind of down to just do that and. Uh, and lean into the diversification aspect here a little bit. So we'll, we'll double tap these receivers that I'm both 1% ownership on. And, uh, kind yeah. Of plug how, that. What are you, what are your general thoughts on kind of these, these older elite receivers? Because I feel like I'm personally higher on, on them than, than most people, um, in all formats, but, um, obviously you said you have a low percentage of, so, so what, why do you think that is? Just thinking of it through the lens of it's week 15 through 17. What do these players project for? Um, just because in, you know, there's lots of people that have done research on this previously, like Hayden did research on this. I know that uh, um, Michael Dubner and I can't remember who he worked with on the article that I'm thinking of at Rotoviz um, did the analysis on production over the course of the season. Um, and uh, and how it changes for rookies versus veterans as a cohort, and sure. seeing that veteran production in fantasy points per game declines steadily over the season, and for rookies it increases. And we are for Devonte Adams. I don't really think he's in the place where we can say that he's physically declining or he's lost anything yet. That we we haven't seen it for Diggs. I think we can kind of say that we we're starting to see it. Like it it definitely down the back half of last season it sure looked like he he either wasn't healthy or he's lost a step, right? Sure. Um, and, and the other thing is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this thought and then go back to Diggs. Um, so for those guys, it's like, yes, I should have some of them in my portfolio for diversification purposes, but I think that between those two and players like Chris Olave or Tank Dell or Rashi Rice, like those are all players... Or Brandon Ayuk, who man, he Ayuk is going much earlier here uh, than he used to. Um, but between all those players, like I'd rather just lean towards the younger players that I think are pretty similar bets to, you know, have 
a season in the same range as these guys, but come the end of the season, I think probabilities in their favor to project slightly better. Um, the other thing with Diggs um, specifically is for Buffalo, I really don't want to take Buffalo pieces without Josh Allen. Um, and I actually, sure. I think playoff best ball really helped to illustrate this, but like you really don't want um, like, let's say it's week 17 there the the path to victory where you have digs no allen is really freaking thin you know you're you're just hoping that it was just so impossible to advance josh allen that the teams that did get josh allen through there's not enough of them and the combinations they have aren't enough to actually beat you um but it's just josh allen accounts for so much of that offense and the total points scored there that if you're going out and taking bills pieces without them being inside of a team stack, I think you're really hurting yourself um, because think of the games where Josh Allen runs for two touchdowns and pretend you have three Bills players with no Josh Allen. Like, it's not like Bills players are cheap either. You know, like you got no, Diggs, James Cook, and Dalton Kincaid all going in like the first six rounds. If you've got three of those guys with zero touchdowns between any of them, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> like That's so yeah. I really for for these rushing quarterbacks like I'm not as excited to take like Devonta Smith outside of an eagle stack Josh Allen is is even more extreme to that even than Jalen Hurts I mean they're both very similar in that regard um but yeah it's like I for for that kind of rushing quarterback who dominates so much of the offense I'm just more prone to want to make sure that I'm playing it in a team stack and I'll have a little bit of digs outside of Josh Allen, like I did here for diversification purposes, but it's not something that I want to go after all the time. You know, like I'm not just going to start clicking naked digs all the time uh, sure. just to get the exposure up. So no, that's very, very well said. And uh, yeah, it's like, you don't want to completely miss out, but that, that point is very, uh, very well understood. So nice. Um, so let's see what else is going on in this draft. We have Steph going AJ Brown, Gibbs, Devonta Smith, and Hertz. So getting a little Philly stack going there. We got Hoosier Devo with the Lamb, Josh Allen, and then Debo. Um, but yeah, I like the CMC Diggs Adams uh, starts. Gives us some options. We got our anchor, and we can kind of uh, take take what comes to us. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited because we're guaranteed one of the uh, elite tight ends that I'm wanting to maintain high exposure on here. Um, and so we're definitely going to take one of Andrews or McBride. Pat has been trying to sell me on Andrews over McBride. I think I'm I still, still feel like I lean McBride. Yeah. I think I'm still in the McBride camp as well. I also really like opening a stack option because I have no viable stacks with either of these guys, right? Yeah. Um, and so we're going to do McBride to open up the Kyler stack that we can get later. I was um, really about to say that. Yeah. And then I'm a little light on Rome. I mean, I'm, I'm above market, but only, only just, you know, and if you look at, I, I've got him with CMC a good bit, but I have him none with Diggs and Adams and I've got him just a tiny bit with McBride. So this feel, I mean, he's the top of the rankings. Um, I, I definitely would prefer to increase my exposure to him over Cooper and I definitely prefer him over these two receivers. And I'm absolutely going receiver here. I'm not taking a running back. And I could bully tight end and go Andrews. But I really, I think with getting the dusty veteran receivers, I want to have a little youth here to help with what I was talking about earlier of, of kind of gearing my projections towards those, those money weeks and getting a player where, you know, historically players in this cohort have seen their production increase as the season goes on. So. Yeah, I feel like this is a really good range for for Rome. I think uh, it's, I mean, yeah, he's going to get drafted top 10 pretty much. It's a lock, right, at this point. And um, just like you said, like shooting for the upside uh, is, is very important in this range. Um, so we started with CMC. Uh, first round, we got Diggs and Adam. So two dusty, dusty vets. And then uh, Trey McBride and Roma Dunes. Um, yeah, this is a really fun start. Uh, got the anchor. And like I said, we can kind of uh, play around with our with our picks now because we have that. So opens up some stuff for us. 
I did. I pulled up my data on my diversification stuff, and Chipsy uh, did come in as the in the 57th percentile um, for diversification. And then uh, you can feel even better, Chipsy, but your diversification actually improved um, when you weighted it for draft capital. So you're even more diversified when waiting for draft capital. You're the 59th percentile, um, which I think is is solid. You're you're totally fine. Um, Again, like I, I think pretty much everyone, even the people in like the hundredth percentile, the best diversifiers, the most diversified people, um, I think are still probably not as good as um, we can get to. Um, but yeah, I, the okay. So Chipsy's not getting roasted, at least not. Nope, yet. nope. Chipsy's not getting roasted. Now, did Bindles? Did you one fifty max BBM or no? I did not. I, okay. I I only got to like fifty something, so I probably won't be in there. Gotcha. Well, if, uh, you know, as we're, as we're sitting here and enjoying the draft, if anyone wants to know their, we'll, we'll get a little sneak peek behind the diversification article. Um, I'll, I'll let you know where, where you fell out of all 851, 150 maxers. So if you maxed and you're in the chat and you want to know, just uh, throw your username in there. I'll pull you up. Um, so something we didn't talk about yet. I just want to like, so what do we think are some of the trends like, uh, like best ball is starting so early this year and we're already kind of seeing some stuff come up, but what do you think some of the trends will be going into the summer, into hot best ball summer and kind of, where do you think will we, will we end up in come August? Like once uh, we're close to the season. Yeah. I mean, I think that the market just kind of reflecting that so many people are, privy to zero RB, like that trend is going to continue. We're just going to keep, you know, I, I think that that is, it's not that there's not other viable roster constructions to win the game, right? Like you can build a robust RB team and, and win a best ball media tournament. Um, but, you know, in general, I think that zero RB is in most circumstances going to give you the best chance of winning these big tournaments. Um, so I think that's kind of the direction that the game heads as we get closer and closer to not a solved game, but a, you know we're approaching the game being more solved. We're having a sure. better understanding of the strategy. So, I mean, I don't think that's too controversial a take. Um, I would guess that when we get, because what I was, what surprised me last year is the difference between drafting in the big board and drafting near the beginning of Best Ball Mania was almost nothing other than the market now having more information to appropriately price rookies. Um, really where you saw the biggest like meta shift was late August, the casuals have arrived, you know, like there's people doing wonky stuff. Um, and that was where you started to get a little bit of a meta shift. Um, and really it was more just like the exploitative strategies became even more powerful. Um, so like Kittle's interesting here. In this room, um, I actually don't hate taking Chris Godwin um, because we're starting to get kind of to the end of the line at wide receiver. And we talked about Chris Godwin being a guy where when you've got that super high Sortino ratio already accounting for like four wide receiver slots, you don't really he doesn't do anything for you. But here we've got three wide receiver slots. They're two dusty guys and one that's a rookie. So, you know, we don't have guaranteed production by any means. Um, I'm definitely interested in taking Godwin here. And then we've got a pretty big teardrop to the next wide receivers. So that's one where I'm, I'm happy to do that. To take him, And then do you want to pair him with Kittle? Just go uh, semi bully tight end here. Yeah. I'm thinking about Kittle, but the other thing that I'm Kyler. considering. Yeah. Cause Kyler is not, he's most likely not getting back to us right all the way to 96 and our stacking options are really limited here. Yeah. Um, I, I say we go Kyler and I'm, I think there's lots of tight ends that could fall to us here where we're very happy. And because we already have McBride, I kind of yeah. want to leave us open for harvesting some of the value that could fall to us. So, and I've done this reach on Kyler before and I, I feel totally fine with it. Um, Really, what I'm what I'm actually sacrificing here, what I would have done if we didn't do Kyler, is I would have taken David Montgomery as my safe, like this plugs NRB slot for me, you know, all the time. Yeah, like we were talking about earlier, yeah. Um, 
which I've got a lot of David Montgomery. I was a little over 20% for a while. I think I'm just under 20% now. Um, but I do that often as my first running back in a zero RB room. Um, just because the way that I want to play zero RB too, is I want to be able to take some swings on some of the higher variance spots. And I don't want that to totally kill my roster. Like, yes, all my teams are going to lose anyway, but if I can mitigate the risk on an individual roster basis by saying when I have a Kendra Miller type situation occur, because Lord knows that occurred a lot for me last year, you know, the team's not dead, you know, like having David Montgomery and then taking a total gooser on one of your, you know, higher variance running back picks that you were excited about um, kind of helps it. So it's like, you got a dead roster spot, but you're still, the team's not dead. You it doesn't know? hurt as bad, yeah. Yeah, whereas if I do something like, all right, we're going to go Trey Benson, Blake Corum, Jonathan Brooks, like we're going all rookies and then like maybe some ambiguous backfield spots or it's like Jaleel McLaughlin or, you know, stuff like that. It's like, yeah, I could I could very easily see it's week one and I score 2.6 points in between both of my RB positions. Like I prefer to not, have my zero RB rooms constructed like that. I want to have some of that, like not to be a projectable volume, bro, but like you do want a little bit of that. Like I, I can count on some of these touches within reason. Um, and so yeah, I think David I, I find is myself, I feel like I'm so comfortable with zero RB that sometimes I do push myself too far and kind of get into that situation you're talking about where it's just like all rookies and, and kind of speculative type guys. And I'm like, I'm there at the end of the draft. And I'm like, uh, this is, even though I have seven RBs or whatever, like doesn't feel great. So um, I think that's a, a smart way to play it. And I, I try to not get to seven RBs a lot of the time. Like I'd prefer to build my team in a way that I'm at six RBs and it's appropriate, right? Like there are times where like those rooms I'm describing are like, oh shit, I'm going to score two points at the running back position. Like you got to add that seventh RB because even if it's only like a 5% chance, this guy does anything for you. It's like, you need that 5% you need bigly. It, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really like Kyler too. I mean, obviously stacked helps as well, but I just feel like I don't like you're talking about the single week, like, I don't think there's that much of a difference. Like, yeah, we, we reached on him, but like, what is the real difference between him and Dak and love? And no. Dak? Yeah. This is all, this is all the same. It's all a big jumble anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see what's going on. So Steph took your, your not boy Kincaid, Christian Watson, and then Ferguson. We, yeah. Godwin definitely helps us with just kind of getting that any eater type guy. Let's see what is coming up here for us. I mean, I, we're, we're going to be pretty squarely in, uh, I mean, since we have CMC, we could potentially push if we're like in a really yucky spot for running back where we just don't want to click any, there are some wide receivers we can take here or some tight ends we can take here. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll let Hoosier make his selection here before I, I pontificate further. Here. Hmm. I've got a pretty good idea of what I want to do here because we do need some more wide receiver firepower a little bit. Um, okay. Let's see. But okay, I, I, I faked him out. I wanted Javante Williams really badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he, uh, he said you faked him out before too. So you're you're you're, uh, you're on your game tonight. Um, um, so we're we're locking in Javante here. I think this price is super fair for like the volume that we can get from him. And I want to, I basically want to have like two to three running backs, like including Christian McCaffrey that are going to produce. And then I want one to two dart throw, like between one and two dart throws. And the last running back is just whatever. I'll probably be right. done with five running backs in this build. Yeah. Um, two in the top 100. I do really like, Sutton here. Actually, I like both Sutton and Myers here as options. I like, yeah, I think I lean Jacoby slightly, but I don't really have a preference, honestly. If we look at ADP, I'm not sad to miss out on any of these top ADP running backs. It's going to be yeah. a while before it gets back to us. So we're probably not getting Zamir White. Um, yeah, I think we're just going to auto Cortland Sutton there. That's fine. Honestly, it. yeah, this is... 
And now, now I feel good enough about the, so we've got this little team correlation here with Javante. We've got the stack with Arizona. Um, and now we've got enough wide receiver firepower where I can fill out the rest with kind of these higher upside bets that I want to be making uh, in the rookies. And yeah. then at running back, I'm not feeling quite so behind the eight ball. Like if we pass on Javante here and then it gets back, you know, the turn comes back to us and we're in the one twenties, right? So we're looking at like ADP in the one twenties here for running back. Then we're like, maybe we get Zach Moss if we're really fortunate. Uh, Jonathan Brooks is probably, I mean, not to set someone up to snipe myself, uh, but it's like, okay. you're, you're, you're hyping him up earlier. So that's yeah, fine. then we're like Chuba Hubbard, Blake Corum. And then we're into the Gus, Gus Edwards at 134 is just that like absolute really bomb. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's like when, if I had skipped, pretend we don't have CMC either. Pretend we were drafting from the two hole. We have the same team. Don't have CMC, you have CD or Tyreek instead. And I, just get Javante Williams and then it comes around and Gus Edwards is here. Like that's fine. Cause he, they're going to give him some goal line carries, whatever. Like I'm, I'm never going to be super excited about it, but it's better than taking the zeros at running back that I'm inevitably going to get. If I don't get a guy like sure. Gus Edwards at that point. Um, but like you can see, I have 0% of him cause I'm typically preferring to construct my teams in a different way. Where like, I want this archetype of player like the innings eater type player to come with a little bit more like javante williams-esque upside where i'm you know there's some ways where it can break where javante williams is actually not just a small win he's a smash here you know where like i don't really see gus edwards ever being a smash like he could you be a feel really good about pick out on gus edwards yeah he could be a good pick but like he's never gonna do a raheem mostert you know, from, um, so anyway. Um, so we are at what five wide receivers. Uh, we have Kyler and then we have uh, Trey McBride at tight end and then Javante and CMC at running back. So, yeah, like you said, like that's that Gus Edwards type guy doesn't really fit with this build, how it's currently constructed. Um, so I think that Sutton and or Jacoby was the right move there. Yeah, because it's like for us, so say, you know, say it gets back to us and we are, we're staring down Gus Edwards, like that doesn't really do a ton for me. Like Christian McCaffrey's one of my running back slots every single yeah, week. Yeah, you're just assuming, yeah. And then my second week or my second running back slot is like Javante should fill that pretty consistently. And then the weeks where he doesn't like, how much is Gus Edwards really outscoring him by, you know, and like what's a true Gus Edwards ceiling outcome? Like he fell into the end zone three times, you know, and got me 21 total fantasy points with 30 yards and three touchdowns. Like, so I, I'd that. much rather, you know, take a swing on some of the more exciting guys with a little upside, less uh, like dusty innings eaters. Sure. Um. So yeah, speaking of, of scroll the F down. So who are some guys that um, kind of you you are pushing up after that? Like, what is it, round 14, 15 range where you kind of feel like you can get an edge on the field? If it, You don't have to give away all your, your uh, secret sauce, but uh, are there any guys that you feel like this doesn't really make sense and that you want to kind of get an edge on the field in that in that way? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see some of them. I don't want to... Um list yeah. them all here before we pick them because we need we need some of them on this team uh <laughs> but okay. we'll definitely get to them here let's, um, let's circle let's circle back around to it though. yeah but there's a few um most of them i'm pretty in line with like what we have as our leg up rankings um i'm gonna be 99 percent of the time in line with there's like one or two players where i have, like i've told pat like hey i, I think i am a little <laughs> higher on this guy like here's why and he's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. But like, he's he's still definitely staying here in the ranks for us. Like, yeah, okay. um, yeah. You got you got to give you got to get give your your uh, your pushback when when you feel like it's necessary. But for the, for the most part, like you know, these are uh, I'm pretty lockstep with with what we're doing now. Who's your Devo? Uh, does have Devo Samuel? Does have George Kittle? 
and gets Brock Purdy 20 picks after ADP yeah, here, that's... I'd be pretty yeah. surprised. Yeah. Well, this is great. This is these are two like high upside running back picks. Um, the other thing that we would be considering here is a tight end. Um, some of these wide receivers I'm excited about too, but I think. Do you want to go? I think I want to hit two of these running backs here, um, and then just have one to finish up with later, and just call it. Yeah. Um, Because we're starting to get into territory, and then let's just do tight end ADP real quick. Do. Yeah, we got we got a couple that can make it back to us. I feel with I feel like with McBride, we don't have to. We don't have to get a tight end until a little bit later. I feel like feel pretty good about these two running backs. Yeah, and so now, so we're we're gonna set ourselves up. Um, we're either gonna be like a two five, um, ten ten three, or we'll probably end up with three quarterbacks. I'm assuming though, just from the nature of the stacks that we can make. Um, yeah, we're gonna end up with some stinky guys. So. We'll probably end up doing something like a three five nine three, um, since we're also going to take tight end kind of late um, to go with McBride. And sure. unless we're really feeling kind of behind the eight ball at wide receiver, then we might do a three five ten two. But okay. that's kind of kind of what we're looking at right here as far as roster construction. Um, and all of yeah. those all of those grayed out just fine as far as like the number of combinations they give us. Um, I don't think we can get ourselves to a two six nine three here, um, which is the like the roster construction that if I can pilot myself perfectly into it every time, like that's two, the six, one that nine, I have three, to use. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do it every time. I feel like this is this is fine. Our, our construction is looking nice, and I feel like the the players that we're we're building along with it feels pretty solid um, yeah and you, you don't want to be ultra rigid with your roster construction it's more of i i really treat that as like a super loose tiebreaker you know sure. like but it's it's more to just kind of like guide me along like if i have the decision to build a team that could go in a two six nine three direction or a team that's gonna have to go like three five ten two I'll prefer two, six, nine, three. If both of those teams have similar caliber players on them. But like if to build a two, six, nine, three, I'm taking players that are objectively worse. Like I'm reaching you don't in our ranks. Like so there's no reason. Yeah. You just build the team, build the structure that fits better with the best players you can have. Kind of like how, how NFL coaches, like the best ones are tailoring their system to their players talents. Right. That's kind of what we're doing with roster construction. We're tailoring our roster construction to the archetypes of our players and not the other way around. But we do know, you know, just like Sean McVay knows what he wants his offense to look like, you know? And so it, same with like Mike McDaniel knows what he wants the offense to look like. So in an ideal world, Mike McDaniel's going to draft some really fucking fast guys. You know, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing too. when we're, we're saying like, I'd like to get to two, six, nine, three, I'd like to take a Devon, a chant, you know? Um, but like if, if the, room is giving me stuff where that doesn't make sense. Like I'm not going to force it. There's no reason you're not gaining a huge advantage by getting one of these higher combination roster constructions. But one thing that I think kind of got lost and maybe I did a poor job explaining it in the article with how I wrote it, but it's not purely the raw number of combos you get from just a two, six, nine, three. It's that those roster constructions that have the largest number of combos are the ones that are the most robust to injury um, okay, and, and bus, which like I I've seen some people be like, yeah, it doesn't matter if the combo, like you have more combos cause you're taking a third tight end or you're doing that. It's like, yeah, you're kind of missing the forest for the trees. Like it's not just that it's that also you're making these rosters much more robust. Like okay. these are going to fail in a, in a way where like, it's not possible for them to advance at a much lower rate because this can withstand a number of different bad things happening to it. Or some of the more fragile roster constructions can't, they can literally only withstand a wide receiver bus. And if you have a bus at any other position, you're fucked, you know, or, or they can withstand no bus. So 
Um, that's one of the things that I think kind of went overlooked and maybe I should have done a better job explaining in my uh, roster combination stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the other thing is like, this goes back to like, don't point out all the mistakes that your opponents are making. So when I see people talking about that, I'm like, you can think exactly what you want about this. Like I, I already gave you the fucking answers to the test. And then you're over here like, I've never done math a day in my life, but I'll be damned if I draft a third tight end. Like, <laughs> hey, power to you, King. Keep accent. donating. Like, um, I'll be in the lobby all day for you. Let's pause for a second. Wait, so let's first pick Drake May. And then I feel like, yeah, let's push running back. So... I'm not going to do a running back here because um, there's guys that I'm down with later. Yeah. Um, and I really want to get my leg at exposure up here a little bit and he's not coming back um this seems like a good cost and definitely not taking josh palmer so yeah and uh and one of the things that uh that like i'll i'll use this effective draft capital for which is basically taking my draft capital model and then using the average adp of this player over every draft that's happened in this tournament so just pulling the adp from every day and multiplying by the number of of draft rooms that were filled there and figuring out how much of each player was drafted at a certain adp it tells me how much draft capital advantage i'm gaining or losing to the field on a given player so like when you take ty chandler right here like if you took Ty chandler with your next pick you'd be gaining six draft capital which is like pretty substantial like a, a player at you know if we go down a couple rounds like the overall draft capital of will levis is like less than six so like if you take ty chandler you're basically getting the value that a will levis adds to your roster for free without costing yourself a roster spot so that's kind of a a thing where i think the most uh like the best use case for it is how to navigate risers and fallers appropriately and like understand the trade-offs that you're making and that like Xavier Leggett has been a big riser. It cost us one draft capital. It doesn't matter. That's a, you know, that's a 20th round pick taking Xavier Leggett here gave the, the tournament on average, the advantage of a, a 20th round pick on me, which like doesn't, it's matter. nothing. It's yeah. Really it nothing. couldn't, like, couldn't matter any less. You know, I forgot to take my change on my, my 99 cent purchase. I paid a dollar. I left my penny behind. Like I'm going to be okay. Yeah, like so go yeah, so going back to what you were just saying before, like I feel like like if you're a new, if you're new to any format, like I feel like you kind of have these may, whatever, maybe you read some stuff, maybe you, some, you watch some stuff, so you kind of have these like parameters in your brain of like, okay, I need to follow this structure. I need to whatever, like there you have some sort of tra I don't want to say training wheels, but like some sort of thing in the back of your head where you're like I need to follow this. I feel like the more advanced you get, the more you can go with the flow and just kind of like take what comes to you in the draft. Um, so I think that's like, whatever, that's kind of what you're saying, but just like, you don't want, you want to have some structure. It's a, it's a part in the game, but you don't want to like, there's so many different things that you're weighing and how do you do that? The more advanced you get and the more drafts you do, you can kind of be, uh, you know take your edge whatever you're doing with all these other things that you we should be doing like like uh structure and other stuff that is kind of uh well known and then that makes you the best player you can be so it's it is a it is a steep slope though like i, I don't think it comes intuitively for everyone or like right away i think you do kind of have to you have to take your licks and um it's definitely something that uh is you're, you're always learning right you don't want to be stuck in your ways anytime so yeah like in, in lots of games um you know there can be defined strategies where you've learned a strategy and you know how to execute that strategy well and so you execute it in every scenario in the game regardless of it's at the optimal strategy in that specific situation you know you can at least execute it so even if it's not the best it might be the fifth best strategy there but at least you could execute it confidently sure um so that's that's kind of the difference between like playing with set strategies and playing flexibly. And in most games, you're going to be rewarded for playing flexibly when you can execute that correctly, right? So in best ball, that's kind of like taking what the room gives you, seeing what other people are doing in your room and trying to exploit that to build the best team that you can. Um, 
versus like I always go zero RB or I always go yeah. anchor RB, right? Like, um, and so it's we, we actually that's another project that I have been working on in the background right now. I've got a tool um, that we're working on that should be a little more helpful for people who like if you're not doing a million drafts, you don't have the whole draft landscape memorized. And so like when you see that, you know, Pat Frymuth, Kate Ott and Johnny Smith and Michael Mayer all went here, I immediately know like, OK, now I'm not taking a tight end until later. So what I'm going to end up doing because the tight ends that are going to be acceptable for this build are going to be available in rounds 18, 19. I'm going to take some wide receivers that I normally take in 18, 19, and I can confidently pull them up here, make sure that I'm getting them, um, you know, because I'll prioritize those over the tight end. If you don't have that, like, memorized, where you know how all the different stuff plays out, this tool will kind of help you visualize um, the different ways that draft strategies can go and kind of, like, identify pockets of value and, and places you'd want to attack, so... Yeah, like like you said, it's it's more of an art than a science, right? Like it's not, uh, which is kind of what you're saying. Like if you have the feel where you do so many drafts, you can kind of feel that out. But if you don't, you're going to be a little bit lost. Um, so do we have any, let's see, Tez Walker. I think we're going to do Ray Davis because that's the running back that I wanted. Um, and there's no one else that I'm like so. Jumping off the screen. Yeah. What uh, other uh, receivers are available here? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm fine with – I'm fine with Walker. I don't really – there's no one else. I don't really want to be taking QJ. Um, Noah Brown, we don't have the stack. QB, I feel like we can push it. Unless yeah, I one. think we're doing Tez Walker here. I'm just thinking through quarterback. Yeah, if there's anyone that we want to just lock up. I, I, I think Tez Walker makes sense. But yeah, so I think we're good at running back here. Um, and then now we probably this is a this is a flexible spot where if we get a good spot for a third quarterback, we can do it. If we don't, we can roll Kyler and Drake May and just be fine with it. Yeah. Um, and then we still need some more wide receiver and we definitely need some more tight end. Um, I think it's setting up nicely, though, for for the pockets that are coming up. Um, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, who's your Devo's asking, when do you decide rank versus ADP? And well, why don't we start with that one? Yeah. Rank versus ADP is, it's not like a, this or that it's, uh, I'm, I'm usually looking at the ADP to see if there's any like major fallers, um, for the most part, I'm going off of my rankings, especially in the big board where I think the market's less efficient than it will be later. Sure. Um, so I want to like hammer the ranking. We have, we have more of a rankings advantage right now, I think, than we will later. So I want to lean into that. Um, but like, for example, when we were here, if Purdy had gotten to us, like, yeah, we're insta giga snap picking Purdy because it was 20 round or 20 picks of ADP you know, within, seen. within the top 10 rounds, like that's still a decent chunk of ADP value and it's stacked with CMC. Like that would have been a no brainer. Um, but like George Kittle here was what, like a tiny bit of 80. He was like a couple picks of ADP value or something. It was like, eh, it doesn't matter enough to me. The, the priority of getting a wide receiver that we had ranked higher than like a significant amount higher than the next best wide receiver was valuable to me. Um, and taking Kyler, like I prioritized the stack with Kyler over taking a naked Dak Prescott and hoping to be able to get Jake Ferguson to fall back to me or a naked Jordan Love and back stacking him with one of the later receivers like Dobbs or, you know, later tight ends. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it. Th there's something that we're working on, too, where like you wouldn't you won't have to figure this out. We'll figure it out for you um, when you take. You know, and it's not like choosing between ADP or choosing between rank. It's like weighting them appropriately. Weighting both, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, I do think it can be hard to kind of – it can be hard to deter determine between those two uh, 
So if there is something that you guys can make, that sounds like it would do very well. Um, so why don't we check out uh, Steph's team really quick while we have a, a second? Let's see. Let's see how uh, she's building. So we've got Jalen Hurts, Derek Carr. So she's. Um, I hate when it when it taps. Right, back like you that. lose it immediately. Maybe we can. Yeah, we'll probably go to the board. Gibbs, Rashad White, Brian Robinson, Ty Chandler, Braylon Allen. That's a pretty strong running back room. Yeah. And then she's got the Eagles double stack. She's hurting a little bit at receiver because her wide receiver three is Christian Watson. Um, and then she goes on to uh, goes into Tyler Lockett. Gets the Green Bay team correlation, adds Lad McConkey as a wide receiver that a, a rookie receiver that's probably going to be more pro ready. Um, so I, I like that. Um, but yeah, she'll probably have to get a good amount of wide receiver here still. Yeah, I think she said in the chat she was like, "Shit, I'm behind on wide receiver." So, all right. So I uh, I know what we're doing here. Um, we we need to take a tight end here. Um, because we're going to run out of viable tight ends. Yeah. And so we're going to do Noah role. Fant um, certainly here. And then. Bye, bye, yeah. Bye. That's my uh, Noah, Noah Fant noise. The bye, bye, bye. Aha. Uh, now we've got Denver. I'm, I'm halfway wondering if I do something really gal brain for a third quarterback later. I mean that's something I can do in the very last round. So we're gonna Corley. we're gonna do Malachi Corley. He's the top of my ranks. Uh, I only have two percent of him, so I'm happy to spread those bets a little bit. Because if you look yep. at my wide receivers, like I got a a gang of all these late guys. You know, I've got a lot of lots of these late dart throws that I think have any any kind of probability of hitting. Um, you know, I got a at least a smattering on them. Um, I think it makes so, sense if you only have two percent, yeah, then just up that a little bit. So we've got three more spots to fill. We'll definitely take a, at least one wide receiver. I, I do like that we've got the divisional correlation with Seattle and Arizona here too. Um, let's, let's see. see. Oh. For May, we could look at. I mean. We could we could play a May to the Patriots thing. Oh, it looks it looks like we may be uh, all out of our Hunter Henry. He's, yeah, I think, he's long he's, gone. I think he already went. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, I'm gonna. I mean, we're at the point where if anyone wants to snipe me on these dusty people, they can they can snipe <laughs> away. I think we're late um, enough. Yeah. But like these are fine. I don't really think like Zach Ertz. I'll do when I have no production at tight end and I just need to, you know, like, all right, I got to get someone out there running. Like he'll probably run some routes. Um, I'm not super excited to do it, but like if, if I have to break glass in case of emergency, I'll do that. Um, but yeah, it's really probably only these two dudes. I could mix in a little bit of Tucker craft, but I think I'd prefer to make those bets with Jordan love. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, so for tight end. All right. Well, we're, we're how do you feel, probably gonna how do you feel about Waller? Are you just out on him now that we don't know what the hell's going on with him? Yeah, I don't really I mean, I didn't really like him last year right. when we knew he was playing, you know, and like granted he's free now, but like just I don't not know, worth the risk. Yeah. Um I just I don't see a ton of upside there, even with him too. So that's kind of my um but I'm definitely willing to yeah, David is is barking up the tree that I am uh, when I when I mentioned Galbraining. Um, I, I think Bo Nix, yeah, is is my Denver Bronco quarterback here potentially. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what we're looking at. If you if you want to snipe on all these shit tier <laughs> players, like be my guest because um, there's plenty of other guys we can can mix in. But uh, David, yeah, I think I mean uh, uh, three leg Greg for the. Uh, Denver correlation. If we do take Bo Nix, we could. Uh, Greg Dulcich is not the tight end one there uh, until until Dricko tells me otherwise. He is squarely behind Adam Troutman, so I won't take hardly okay. any Greg Dulcich. Um. So let's see. We have how many wide receivers do we have so far? How how do we want to close this out? 
Uh, we're at two five eight two. So we'll ideally we would close tight end, wide receiver, quarterback, okay. Um, okay. and just get that you know that upside of okay, it's Bo Nix. It's it's stacked with two guys on Denver. He's probably not going to do anything, but in the event that you know he does, this is we're we're exposing ourselves to an offense that everyone has said sucks, right? Like the first Denver Bronco went at pick 90 something, you know, <laughs> like, and, and then we followed it up with another one and, you know, pick 100 range. And so it's kind of what you were saying earlier with like the, the Bryce young and CJ Stroud thing from last year, just whatever. If, if the, if everyone is going to price them down uh, and we just need upside, that's where we want to lean into the variance. So. Yeah. Oh, championships. Mine sniped my Greg Dorch. Oh, Short King Spring is no longer, uh, no longer. Done. I mean, the, if there was someone up, the Gesicki snipe is actually the one that that is more oh, painful because, like, there's a million. You know, I, I'm happy clicking so many dart throw wide receivers. Sure. Um, but but tight yeah, end. tight end, it's probably looking pretty toast here. Like, I don't really think. Do we? Is it even worth it to take one of these guys, or should we? Most likely not. I think we're probably just gonna gonna ride the Trey McBride train here. I feel um, like yeah, that feels better. Than and just... then I think we'll just use that as reason to find up the. We're gonna. We're not caring about position here. We're caring purely about like the upside, upside. that the player offers to our okay. roster because that's what we're after. So who do who do what? Bonix definitely taking him as the um, QB three. I think we're gonna go ahead and do Brandon Rice actually. Okay, I like I like the upside on Brandon Rice. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of I, I was I had a lot of Brandon Rice. Then I slowed down on clicking him, and I'm kind of back on my bullshit on Brandon Rice. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that, and then I think we'll just end in a we'll end with a three five ten two because like, am I ever gonna take Tucker Craft? I mean, I have zero percent Tucker Craft. Un unstacked Tucker Craft though. Yeah. Or do we just want to get our wide receiver? I mean, no, there's there's so many. We'll just do we'll do our bow next like thing. Nick makes sense with two Denver guys and just uh, galloping that. Yeah, I don't I don't think I have any bow necks in uh, in the big board yet. So, oh, that was a lie. I've got two percent bow necks. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? This I wonder if this is pulling in my. I don't think it is. Rookies um, and sophomores. Yeah, is there anyone in rookies and sophomores that I draft that I don't draft here? I don't think so. Oh, well. So, wait, you yeah. said you did how many rookies and sophomore drafts? 100? I did 100, yeah. Those are those are shorter, though, right? Those are only, like, 10 minutes. Yeah, they're super quick. Um, yeah, some of them are even, like, five minutes. Um, what, um, what, uh... So you, you kind of do a mixing of all the different contests. Do you have any contests that you would like to see that, that aren't in there right now? Um, or is there anything that like you, you want them to like different uh, cost or different structure or different uh, things that you're, you're interested in? Um, I, I definitely like the ones where I have like a lower variance way to realizing some profits. Like, of course I'm going to max the bigger board. Um, or, or biggest board, I can't remember, but yeah, but the larger of the two nice boards. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll do. I, I like stuff like that. Um, I'm excited for rather than like specific structures. I'm more excited for different game types. Like I want them to release new game types, like they did with Eliminator. I thought that was really cool. Um, I've heard some rumblings that they're going to have more unique game types like that. Um, I just want stuff where there are uh, like meaningful strategic differences. And I, I don't mean like stuff like Superflex, like Superflex is so boring to me because it's not like a meaningful, like the meaningful difference in strategy is just like changing the way that you're valuing the players based on the positional requirements. Like that's not that interesting to me. If you really like to make that interesting, you, you got to do something really wonky for me. Like two QB just isn't going to cut it. Like I need something where we're starting like six running backs, you know, and two wide receivers. Like now I'm interested, you know, but like, I don't stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that type of change leads to interesting 
contests because that's so quickly solvable. Um, cause all it is, is just like figuring out the, the value of a replacement and the positional scarcity, um, and adjusting your rankings accordingly. Um, yeah, Chipsy talking about my, my contest idea, my baby, the Cerberus in chat here. Um, I've mentioned this one a number of times, uh, to underdog and just out, out in the trying, universe. Trying to get it out there. And the I'm industry. putting it out there. If, if they make it like, dude, they got a, they got a fan for life. Like all. <laughs> I mean, I'm already a huge fan of, of what underdog does and like any, any, uh, like critiques that I've ever, uh, levied towards underdog, they're all coming from a place of like, I just love your fucking product, man. Like I want to, I like using this. I like the service you're providing. I like the services that I use to be the best that I can. So like, here's the stuff I would change. Like when I'm, I'm never like coming at it from a place of like, oh my gosh, these, this platform sucks. You know, like, no, it's like, it's already really good. Like coming from a place of love. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, like for, for the Cerberus, that would be, I mean, I'd, I'd be the biggest underdog simp of all time if they give me the Cerberus here. Um, which for, for those of you that haven't heard me talk about it, that's just my idea to help reduce pod variance. Um, but in a fun way, rather than making the pods just giant and making like a larger percentage advance, like three of 48 rather than one of 16. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and throw some guys in. Uh, Johnny Wilson. Oh, God. I'm, I like Johnny Wilson. You, you, you like uh, Aeneas Smith? I'm more of an Aeneas Smith than a Johnny Wilsoner, but you know what? Um, Pat's also kind of selling me on Michael Thomas, and I think I, that, I saw that. I think I could. I think I've clicked it. Yeah, I've clicked him a little bit before. Yeah, and so I'm happy to uh, happy to build out because like the places where Michael Thomas could land, like I could see Denver being a place where he lands, you know. And so we'll we'll build out that Denver bet. Bo Nix is handing the ball off to Javante Williams and chucking it to Cortland Sutton and Michael Thomas. And I mean, if you look at this wide receiver room, like we definitely could use a little bit more uh, front loaded production, which Michael Thomas Absolutely. would definitely bring to us. Uh, and I, I think he plays, you know, I don't think he's going to not wind up on a team. Um, I don't, I'm not super high on him. I don't think, you know, he was my lat the 240th pick, but <laughs> um, given what was available, I think yeah, I think between bet. him, Anaya Smith, and Johnny Wilson, you could randomize between those three and be just fine. Yeah. What about Michael Thomas and the Michael Thomas role? How about that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They they said it very well on ship chasing last night. Um, so let's name this bad boy. Now the the problem is I don't think that we have any real viable Drake May stacks. So we're we're looking like purely for a uh, Drake May gets a rookie. Um, type thing or that it's just his rushing upside is, i was gonna say yeah i think he obviously he, he's he's white so he, people aren't baking in his rushing upside as much but i do <laughs> feel like he has a lot of rushing upside so um so we have a three five ten two uh with some some gross wide receivers to finish us up but we have kyler murray drake may Bo Nix, um, and then running back, we have CMC, Javante, Chase Brown, and then two rookies with Trey Benson and Ray Davis. Uh, we started out with some some old guys with uh, Diggs and Adams, Roma Dunes, Chris Godwin, uh, kind of our inning eater, uh, as Sack would say, Cortland Sutton, Leggett, Javantez Walker, Malachi Corley, uh, Jerry Rice's son, and then Michael Thomas, uh, last round pick. And then we have two tight ends with Trey McBeast and uh, uh, channel favorite Noah Fant. So you know it's apt that we would take Noah Fant uh, when you're drafting with me. So yeah, I mean after you told me that you were also high on Fant, like that was that was set in stone that we were taking we Noah to. Fant there. Yeah, um, I wasn't, wasn't going to risk him not coming back to us there. Uh, we we were just going to go ahead and take him at pick 192. I I, I like it. I feel, I, I feel like. Uh, like you said, like week 17 shows around, comes around and he, he could project very well. Um, so do you have any other thoughts on trends or anything uh, before we close out that you think um, are going to, going to show up uh, over the summer? Uh, you, you, you don't have to, if you don't want to, but if there's anything else that you feel like is really popping in your brain, then, then feel free. But 
Hmm. Uh, gosh. I mean, I think that the tight ends where they're going right now, the elite ones will get pushed up. Pushed I think, up, yeah. I think the wide receivers going that are going before them will be the thing that slides back. Um, so like I I wouldn't be surprised at all to see DJ Moore go behind the big three where the big three are Travis Kelsey, uh, Mark Andrews, and Trey McBride. Oh, and and Sa- how am I forgetting Sam Laporta? Um, so I guess the big four early tight ends there. Um, like I wouldn't be surprised at all to see DJ Moore wind up behind those guys and like Keenan Allen and all all the uh, the wide receivers kind of in that range slide down a little bit and create more of a, like a tier break at wide receiver there. Um, Yeah. Wide receiver is going so high right now. I mean, it is, it is March. So I feel like everyone who's drafting is kind of leaning that way. So. Yeah. And then uh, as far as like other trends, um, I think it's kind of a no brainer that Caleb rises um, from where he's at right now. Just, you're gonna you're gonna get so much frothiness when he gets picked by the bears and they've got keenan allen they have dj moore so like if there's anything that prevents um dj moore and keenan allen reaching more appropriate prices because like every site that has rankings out right now has buried them pretty far below their adp you know like etr has them really low we've we've got them really low over at leg up um compared to where they're going in adp um, but the market's just taking a while to correct because it it does, um, yeah. you know, like it the market is anchored to the previous ADP, so it takes a little bit to get there. The thing that could prevent that correction from happening is just the irrational exuberance surrounding Caleb Williams and saying, I, I'm going to take these guys to set up my Caleb stack. And then you end up with something where you're looking at like a DJ Moore stays in the early third, you know, Keenan Allen I guess Keenan Allen would probably you'd end up getting them to all kind of line up. So you'd get like DJ Moore early third, Keenan Allen late fourth, right, to come back. And then I bet you wind up with like Caleb Williams seventh round, you know? I can see that easily. Yeah. I um the the, the steam is gonna be absolutely insane. Like like it's yeah, I, I, I can see that. Um Hoosier Devo is asking, can we sauce his team? Do you have a second? Yeah, we can we can sauce this team. Let's go in here, um, and we'll we'll do it. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look at it like this. All right. Um, so we've got Josh Allen, Brock Purdy, Geno Smith. Looks like he's got them all stacked, so that's good. I okay. So his Brock Purdy pick was sick. Like getting to push the value. This is uh, by the way, this is the benefit of drafting Josh Allen. Is you now don't give a fuck about quarterback, and so you're like. Do I have two 49ers that I want to stack? Yes, I do. Do I give a shit if you take my Brock Purdy? No, I don't. Yeah. So don't. this was like this was expertly played. This is like exactly how I do it when I have Josh Allen. It's like, all right, I got Josh Allen, CD Lamb. How far can Dak Prescott fall? Like that's that's <laughs> the game falls, when you he does. It. He definitely falls sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, and so getting that level of insurance of Josh Allen as your quarterback feels really good to do it. Um, he's got the the full monster Buffalo team stack. So that's pretty good. I, I I dig that. I don't even hate the Dawson Knox late pick. Like I don't, I don't love it outside of the stack, but stacked up, like we talked about Josh Allen dominates so much of the team's total fantasy points scoring. So when you get it correlated with Dawson Knox, like, yeah, this is going to be fine. It's because it's a Josh Allen touchdown to Dawson Knox, which will almost certainly happen some this year and really you yeah. only you only need it to happen once in weeks 15 through 17 and you're probably happy with it um let's see where, where are you guys at on uh curtis samuel uh let's see where are we at it curtis samuel uh we've got him oh can i not change to see oh this maybe one? not in the draft oh unfortunate um I think we're pretty close to ADP on Curtis Samuel, though. I don't think sure. we're that far off. Uh, running backs, James Cook, totally fine pairing that with Josh Allen. I think that's good. Devin Singletary, a little early on Devin Singletary, but you were at the turn. And so what did you do with your other pick? That was AD Mitchell. And then you took Singletary um, just because you kind of needed a running back at that point, And you were you're really set at wide receiver, so that's fine. 
I probably there's a, there's a thing I probably deviate from. Let's go to the board and see what happened here. Yeah, what's um, this right? Devin Singletary pick for me probably is. Oh, I guess none of the tight ends were there right. either. Yeah, if if uh, if Injoku had made it, it would have been Injoku for me, like ten times out of ten here, and just like be done at tight end and, and be happy. Um, yeah, I probably prefer. Uh, Moss to Singletary's fine. Yeah, yeah none, of, none right. of this. None of this is like crazy out of line. This, it's actually, it's fine. I think. It's not that. Because um, really, what he did was, he said, "Give me one of these running backs instead of Brock Purdy," and then got Brock Purdy to fall. Anyways. So it's like, it's the same thing as taking Purdy here and Singletary here, right? Um, what would have been really sweet is if there were any dudes available with an ADP value here. Cause it's still early enough that that matters a little bit, like a D de- a decent one, you know, like a 10, 10 pick value. Um, then you're really excited about it and you're hammering them. Like, like if you got a, you know, Ramondre Stevenson or a Jalen Warren to fall here, then you're, you're gladly you're cooking, doing that. Um, yeah. But like Singletary is fine. So I, I recant that being something I'd do different. That's probably, <laughs> probably right. I think I'd take Moss personally, but it's fine. They're not much of a difference. Yeah. Um, he's, he's going heavy innings year here with Gus Edwards. Cause he kind of needs to It makes sense. I'm not a super big Marshawn Lloyd fan, but that's like a, that's like a sack player take thing. I mean, like we've got him ranked appropriately. I feel with leg up ranks. So if you're taking him where we've got him ranked, like I'm never going to tell you that you're doing something wrong. Um, sure. I just, in my limited exploration of his profile and watching a very tiny bit of him play, I'm like not as excited about him. Um, I really like the Eli Mitchell pick. I think that's good. And Fran, yeah. Don't love the Damian Harris pick. I think I think here just take like there's some running backs left that you take over that. Like take Izzy Abanacanda, take Frank Gore Jr., take Isaiah Davis, Someone take with more upside. Emmanuel yeah. Wilson, like Ty, even Ty Johnson's better than Damian Harris, right? Like, um. Yeah, I just I wouldn't do Damian Harris here. It feels like the Bills kind of told us that yeah, you're not that they don't into like him. him. Um, that's a bit. I mean, that's your literal twentieth round pick. Like, <laughs> whatever. Not not a huge deal. Um, and then wide receiver. Yeah, I, I liked all these early picks when we were scrolling through them. Um, yeah, this is this is solid at wide receiver. I don't have very much Malik Washington. Uh, again, that's like a my my level player yeah. take. Um, but like you'll like you kind of see when I was um, going through all the late wide receivers, I've got a little bit of almost everyone. And I'm just I'm kind of like removing some players from the pool where I'm like, I just don't think that bet pays out at a high enough probability for me to worry about getting buried by it. And like, can Malik Washington beat me? Fuck yeah. You know, like he absolutely could. Of course. I just think it's a low enough probability that I'd rather focus on the bets that I think have a higher chance to hit. And I want to get overweight on those rather than like spreading my bets on players that I, I feel less, less good about there. Um, and yeah. then tight end, this is fine. I don't love the Gerald Everett. <laughs> yeah. So in, like what ended up happening is you got put between a rock and a hard place. I think this Devin Singletary, the way it shook, the room shook out for you kind of put you between a rock and a hard place. Maybe you forego. Yeah, it's here. It's, it's here. Um, It's the Gus Edwards for Dalton Schultz or it's Devin Singletary for, yeah, so I think you take Devin Singletary because it's like there's a massive chasm before the next tight end you want to draft of Dalton Schultz. And then instead of Gus Edwards, you just take, take Dalton, Dalton Schultz here. And then maybe you end up having to sacrifice Curtis Samuel as your Bills stack to get like Jerome Ford or like you would you would have loved like Charbonnet would have been great for you or Jalen Wright or even like Ty Chandler. Yeah, so that's, that's how I do it different. I would have taken Ty Chandler over Marshawn Lloyd too. Um, but again, personal preference thing but yeah this is a i mean it's a great team i usually would end with two quarterbacks with josh allen but like you have them all stacked up yeah um, fine. So yeah this is a solid team man um well sack i really appreciate you coming on you know i always 
learn stuff from from all your content um and you, you know your your game theory brain is is extremely extremely top notch so like i said that's something i need to to dig into deeper so i will continue to uh to always push your work but um do you have anything to plug um anything else you want to you want to close us out with got uh, got a couple articles in the hopper over at leg up um some stuff about portfolio diversification um working on a piece about battle royales, uh, which is a format I haven't really done much on previously, but uh, feel like there's an edge there. And so it's something I'm starting to explore, wanna see what the interest is from our subs on that. And if that's something that they're wanting me to uh, try and try and help them beat. Um, and then we've got some other tools and exciting things in the work over at Leg Up, where um, if you want to kind of take my game theory ideas and then apply those in your drafts without having to figure it all out yourself or properly balance everything or do that. Uh, I think we've got some cool stuff in the works um, that you'll really like. So, yeah, make sure to uh, uh, subscribe to leg up. Um, I will put the link uh, down below after and uh, I hope you guys have a great night. Um, we have, Liam Murphy coming on next Friday. So that should be a very fun one. I'll have to, uh, you know, hype up the, the Bills players uh, as much as I possibly can. Um, but otherwise, uh, make sure to like the video, subscribe. If you leave a comment, that helps the channel a lot. And uh, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks so much, guys.